you know, those Jimmy Neutron videos were some of the most fun I've ever had making a video, and I think it's some of my best work, so, you know, it kind of got me thinking about other nostalgic shows I could cover on the channel. The obvious answer is Lilo and Stitch the series. It's the only thing that even comes close to my Jimmy Neutron obsession. I was deep into Lilo and Stitch the series. But that one's a little heavy. There's a lot of groundwork you gotta do before you even get into the show, and I don't know, I think I'd rather just get my feet wet before I dive into that one. Definitely something I would like to cover, just not quite yet. I suppose after Jimmy Neutron ended, my next favorite series was Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, although that was never quite to the level of my obsession with Jimmy Neutron. It wasn't like I was throwing Foster's-themed parties or dressing as characters for Halloween. It was just, you know, another show I liked since my favorite show had ended. And then it hit me. There was a series I was obsessed with before Jimmy Neutron... That's right. Veggie Tales is a show that needs no introduction. I think this is one of the greatest series ever, period. Full stop, no qualifiers. The fact that it is a Christian show for toddlers makes it all the more worthy of praise. I suppose it's more of an all-ages show, it's not like Sesame Street or Barney, but still, they worked within the restrictions of being appropriate for even the youngest audiences. And for Christian content? Forget it, nothing even comes close. I feel like way too much Christian content comes from a place of perceived necessity. They get caught up in the idea that they gotta make something wholesome and Christian for their kids. They forget to make a good show. The fact that I, someone who is no longer a child nor a Christian, still finds enjoyment in this is exceptional. Plus, it's the rare show that succeeded without a network. They just put these out on VHS. It wasn't airing on TV, at least not at first. Yet, it's become a pop culture staple simply through home releases. There really has never, ever, 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 ever been a show like Veggie Tales. But unlike Jimmy Neutron, where I was the first person to dive into the whole series, Veggie Tales has been pretty extensively covered. I don't want to have to go into the backstory of the show or who worked on it or whatever. You want to know all that? I think Saber Spark actually did a really good job covering it, so maybe watch his video. Or, you know, read Phil Vischer's autobiography. It's really good. I simply want to talk about every single episode, and I just think it'd be fun to do that by ranking the whole thing. All 50 episodes of the main series, plus I'll throw in the two movies just for fun. I'm not talking about the Netflix show or the later revival or that 2D Larry Boy cartoon, just normal Veggie Tales. Now I must admit up front that unlike Jimmy Neutron, where the only episodes I hadn't seen were the two Nick buried, in this case I actually hadn't seen a decent bit of the show. I stopped watching the series somewhere in the late 2000s, so there's 20 plus episodes I'm watching for the first time. So yeah, I'm sure nostalgia is gonna play some role in the rankings, but you know, even when I was watching it, I thought the show had sort of declined in quality later on. I'll try to be as fair as I can, but I know I'm gonna get suckered in by some song I listened to endlessly as a kid. Like, Two days before I started watching all these, I managed to sing the entire Oh No, What We Gonna Do song word for word, despite having likely not heard it in over a decade. Just, uh, so you know where I'm at with Veggie Tales. Anyways, let's get this thing rolling with the worst Veggie Tales episode. I call it last place. Ding! Wow, did you ever want to see the hetero version of Star of Christmas? Look, I'm gonna complain about a lot of episodes being similar, but this is Star of Christmas to an excruciating level of detail. The main character wants to put on a big production to remind people of the true meaning of the holiday while missing the true meaning of the holiday. Meanwhile, a local church is putting on a pageant with an important star, the Star of Christmas being rare 
Diamonds and the star of Easter Sunday being an American Idol winner, which is pulling audience and cast members away from the big play. Same misconception about them writing plays up to the day it's released, there's a crazy inventor whose invention has to help them make it to church on time, with the same dangerous boost needed to get them all the way there. They even destroy the theater in both of them, it's the same episode. Oh, but wait, it's that little bit worse because Petunia isn't even pretending to be helping people. She is blatantly doing this for her own ends and is keeping homeless children from having a playground. The characters in Star of Christmas were way more likable and relatable. It felt like a mistake any artist could make. And to make matters worse, this is one of the least funny episodes. They've had bad jokes, but I've never seen them whiff it this hard this many times. At one point, they just play Lost Puppies in its entirety. Again. There's no joke, it's just Lost Puppies again. I guess the Scallions have dropped Frankencelery from their band. So you are a barbershop quartet. Quartet? And the silly song, while not the worst, is a weaker one. Yeah, nope, this is last place. And you know what? It's not even that bad. I mean, it's better than at least four or five Jimmy Neutron episodes. This is a failure, but it's a pretty mild failure. There was definitely a decline in the show's later years, but I'm kind of surprised by how shallow the drop-off was. Kind of weird doing this right after my Wikipedia's Worst video, where I spend the first 20 or so episodes spewing some real vitriol, only to do this and start off by going, eh. It's not that bad. Bad, certainly, but not that bad. It's only up from here. We're men. We're men in tights. Tight tights! Today we're learning to deal with Hurt, first with a story about Junior under the assumed alias Lenny, or... Or wait, is his full name Leonard Asparagus Jr.? Eh, I think it's just a character. Who's disappointed that, unbeknownst to him, Leap Day has delayed his birthday. This is some of the most reading your toddler a bedtime story fluff I've seen on the show. Not quite to snoodle levels, but at least the snoodle segments had unique visuals and designs. This is just Junior's room again. I don't even mind the story so much, I'd just much rather have a few good songs than this whole long nursery rhyme. It's not bad, it just doesn't stimulate me, an adult well outside the show's intended demographic. I hate that this episode is old enough for me to call the silly song dated. This is such an early 2010s hip-hop ballad and I hate that we are far enough from that era that I can identify it as such. Then in the Robin Hood parody, they fundraise from the rich because stealing is wrong and breaking the law even under oppressive and openly illegitimate regimes is bad. Yeah, no, this isn't it. May I put you down as a twosome? Excuse me? Nezzer's verse in the ham song is neither the bunny song nor the mine song from Lazy Town, both of which it feels like it wants to be, but the part where he and Larry's parts blend together is really good. You might even say it goes ham. You know, if you, you really wanted to make a pun, it, it's fine, it doesn't go that hard. They have a giant pickle, but it's not even the same giant pickle as before, although he kind of got absorbed into the giant squash. This is one of the hardest sits of the series, but there are at least one or two things I like, which is enough to put it above Twas the Night Before Easter. But there's also a few things I didn't like, and most of it I was just bored by. A frustratingly lame episode, as opposed to the typical boring lameness of the series at this point. But we still got a lot of that boring lameness to get through, so let's just keep this train wreck a rolling. No. You pinched my pork chops! Dude, you can't say that on Veggie Tales. Do you believe in God? Of all the VeggieTales episodes, this feels the most overtly Christian. Usually they give good morals regardless of the religious angle, like don't lie or be nice to each other. But even when it's gotten more religious in its messaging, I've generally still enjoyed the episode and what it has to say. This, more than any other episode, feels like it's trying to convert me. And I'm not gonna pretend that doesn't affect my enjoyment a bit. 
Now, I'm not gonna dock points for that. It's a Christian show. I can't be shocked when they try to convince me I should be Christian. Heck, I could see Christians getting upset that they didn't try harder to convert people. I will dock points for name dropping Billy Graham of all people. That dude kinda sucked. Also, Gideon plays tuba for a team called the Warriors, and I also played tuba for a team called the Warriors, so I was forced to watch this episode even though it was well after I had stopped caring about VeggieTales. So I kinda already had a bad taste in my mouth with this one. But even personal problems aside, I don't like this one. The pirates who don't do anything take over to tell us if we can trust God. So Pa tells the story of this actual real dude who ran an actual real orphanage named George Muller. It's not even a Lutfi's fanciful flannel graph thing where the style's different. They adapt this man's real life with vegetables. And it's not a story that lends itself to a lot of comedy. Pretty much the only joke is that Pa works for one of those zany comedy tabloids. Then we get the story of Gideon, which even as a kid I thought was a kinda lame Bible story I didn't really get. Oh boy, God helped the Israelites win a battle despite staggering odds against them. Never heard that one before. We're running out of A-list Bible stories, we're on to B and C list. And VeggieTales doesn't really do anything to elevate the story. They also leave out the part where Gideon just kills some guys for not giving him bread, and the part where the Israelites immediately go back to worshipping false gods the second Gideon is dead. Yeah, middle era of VeggieTales was odd, I think about half the segments work and half don't, so sometimes you get lucky and both segments are good, and sometimes you get Gideon Tuba Warrior. The only thing I like is the music, which pretty much means I liked nothing because it's Veggie Tales. I always like the music. Bob gets to do a silly song on ukulele, and it's my favorite part of the episode. Weirdly, I've seen this one get memed on, and you know what? I get it. It is a bop. I also liked Pa's song before it went on way too long and name checks a guy who really sucks. I don't know, maybe I'm hung up on personal biases, but I just don't think this one's very good. If you think I'm being too hard on this one, I don't know, drop a comment or something. Let me know what you think. I want candy. I want candy. It's a Princess and the Pauper story, but with a Hannah Montana knockoff. Would you be surprised if I told you this one was really boring and predictable and I don't have a lot to say about it? I really hated the Hannah Montana show as a kid. I don't know why it was always on at my house. I don't even think my brother liked it. I honestly believe it was my mother who wanted to watch that show. Also, her song is kind of a ripoff of I Want Candy, which I thought was the worst song I'd ever heard when I was a small child. Move my feet to the beat down in my soul. For the people, that's how I roll. But I've kind of outgrown both of those grudges. The reason I don't like this episode is because I've seen it done a hundred times. Just making her a pop star is not enough of a change. All you need to do is read the title, Princess and the Pop Star, and you already know everything that happens in this episode. This silly song is kinda catchy, but the pigs make me uncomfortable, and I cannot explain why. I guess it's cool that they confirmed Archibald is gay, though. That's it. That's all I have to say. Come on, if you're gonna suck, at least give me something to talk about. You are without doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of. Oh yeah, that'll do it. Thanks. I had to think long and hard about my placement of the Pirates Who Don't Do Anything movie. VeggieTales has been lame and predictable before, but never on such a grand scale. Sure, this isn't their first movie, but this one had studio backing. All eyes were on them and they totally fumbled it. I guarantee there were kids who only ever saw this movie and decided not to watch VeggieTales because of it. And it's not like it's for the fans, either. This is so very disconnected from the series. They all have different names, and while I guess Pa and Mr. Lunt don't really have established first names, I think Larry should have at least stayed Larry. I get it, they always play characters with different names, but calling them Elliot, George, and Sedgwick just feels off in a movie where so many other things already feel off. 
They've foregone any Christian message in this one, likely a studio mandate, and while a Christian message wouldn't fix this movie, it does add to the overall corporate feeling of the movie, and that's a big problem. VeggieTales has never felt so corporate and cynical. If anything, episodes were a little too sincere. So, I think there is a pretty strong case to be made that this movie deserves to be in absolute last place, but there's little nuggets in there that remind me of good Veggie Tales, fleeting moments of the show I loved. And that's more than I can say for some of these episodes. Neither of these feel like Veggie Tales, and while this is a bigger betrayal than this, it also reminds me of Veggie Tales more often. So to that end, it gets ranked a little bit higher than the bottom. In the distant past, a prince is taken prisoner by the king's brother, a notorious pirate, and his sister must send an orb her father made into the future to find heroes. In the present, Elliot, Sedgwick, and George, you know there was already a mustached character named George, right? Work at medieval times but for pirates, and the orb finds them and takes them back to pirate times, and already this is way too complicated. In the first movie, the pirates exist in the present and in Bible times, and no one questions it. And you wouldn't even have to do that in this movie, it, it could just all be in the past. Anyways, they have to follow a series of clues to find the pirate's cave, and along the way they have to learn to be heroes. I think their arcs are a tad weak, Larry has to stop being scared, Lunt has to stop being lazy, which I think should have been their whole angle. They are the pirates who don't do anything, they don't all need separate arcs. And Pa has to, I don't know, be courageous or something? But he also kinda has to stop being lazy in one song and then that's it? You see what I mean? It's such a weak arc, I can barely describe what's going on in it. Another way this feels disconnected from VeggieTales is all the new characters. And I get it, you want to introduce new characters for the movie, Jonah introduced Khalil. But apart from the pirates, pretty much every major character is someone new. The usual staple of vegetables appears at the very beginning during the modern portions. Except Archibald, who gets to exist in the past, because he was in the first movie, I guess? I'd honestly have less of a problem with this decision if they hadn't put Archibald in. Although, I find most of the new characters pretty boring. Though, I guess I also don't like the old characters in this one, so I'm not gonna act like the new characters are the problem. The villain has a robot body, which combined with the time travel orb gives me big treasure planet vibes. I thought this was a Pirates of the Caribbean cash-in. Treasure Planet wasn't even successful. And it's also a better movie. Movie. The music is just okay, which is an insult to a VeggieTales property. I like the Heroes song, but there's like three songs in the whole movie, and none of them hold a candle to the Jonah soundtrack. The Rock Lobster parody at the end made my friends so upset, especially because that's where they decided to slip in their mandatory Bob cameo. I bet all the kids in 2008 were just rolling in the aisles at a B-52s reference. There's basically nothing I like about this movie, but apart from it being a betrayal of a series I like, there's nothing I really hate about it either. I mentioned that a biblical message wouldn't fix the movie, but the first movie was an adaptation of a Bible story. Surely there was some big Bible story you could have adapted for the second one. I know everyone's waiting for the VeggieTales version of the Jesus story, even though that's definitely never happening. But the show was almost always Old Testament stories. Maybe you could do an Apostle Paul movie or something. Or, you know, you could just not make a second movie. The first one was good, but it also did nothing good for Big Idea as a studio. There was no reason to make this pirate movie. I can't bring myself to hate it, but I also can't bring myself to ever watch it again. This isn't the Ark. What? This isn't the Ark!
Well, the final episode wasn't ranked last place, so I get to dive right into tearing apart these designs. Yeah, the final episode of the original series uses the designs from the then-upcoming Netflix series Veggies in the House, so I absolutely get to talk about why these designs just don't work. I don't dislike them, they're acceptable, but I can definitely tell that these were made by a talented animator in the 90s, and these were made by DreamWorks Animation in 2014. They've lost a lot of character while adding too much unnecessary detail. The textures have so much going on, they stop looking like real vegetables. Junior has gotten the worst of it, at least from what I've seen in the episode and the commercials on the DVD. It's a totally different character, I feel. By contrast, I think Petunia looks a lot better like this. I'd almost compare it to, like, Lola Bunny, who was way too much in her debut appearance, but the simpler style of the Looney Tunes show helps curb an overly designed character. Although I think Petunia and Lola are over-designed in very different ways. But you know, in sanding off this edge, you also lose what made Bob and Larry work. In terms of weirdly specific nitpicks, I hate Paw's pupils, and the French Peas mustaches are dumb. Also, this isn't so much a design choice, so much as a change I don't like, but Madame Blueberry's voice is just so, so wrong. But I trust him, and I trust God. That's not her. That's not Madame Blueberry. Despite the designs, this is still structured like a normal episode of VeggieTales and was released as part of the original series. They even reanimated bits of the opening, although instead of having clips they just show the covers of every episode, which I guess is acceptable for a series finale. In this episode we learn about following God's plan as we're told the story of Noah from the perspective of his son, Shem, voiced by special guest Wayne Brady. Man, I I can't believe they got God himself in this series. He wants to start his life with his new wife, but his crazy dad has built an ark and now he's gotta deal with the flood. Noah's Ark feels like one of those stories VeggieTales just has to do eventually, although they kinda already covered it in Minnesota Cuke 2 and that's probably for the best. We don't talk enough about how this story, the one that seems to be a very popular story for children, is about God killing everyone on Earth. Everyone's dying, but hey, let's sing about this cool, fun cruise we're going on. In fact, with this in mind, Shem becomes the whiniest, most self-centered character ever. Oh, boo-hoo, I can't start living the life I want. People are dying. Literally everyone but you and your family are dead. Get over it. There's basically nothing about this episode I like, but there's also very little I dislike, which is kind of a wild thing to say about an episode I put in the bottom 10. But yeah, there are episodes ranked higher than this that I had a more negative time with, but that also had some stuff I liked. This episode is just... nothing. For the most part, the final few episodes of the series are just... fine. And of the just... Fine episodes, this is the one I have to make the most concessions with. Still, it speaks to how good the show is that we're already out of what I'd consider the worst episodes. I would at least call this a D-tier episode. This is the Bible story of the Ark! Noah's Ark! And you are not in it! The music is decent, although not as catchy as some of their best episodes. The silly song is Easter related, even though the episode is not. It's kinda whatever. As far as a note to go out on, I mean... It's not really trying to be one, it wants you to go watch Veggies in the House. But I guess they did a grand story to go out on, even if it focuses a lot on Wayne Brady with characters like Lunt or Nezer just not showing up at all in the finale. There's not even a big sign-off at the end, it ends on a poop joke. Thanks, DreamWorks. I was worried this could end up being the worst episode, and while it's well below the show's usual standards, it's not anything really worth getting upset over. A lame ending to be sure, but that doesn't surprise me. The cows that appear at the very end of this series are foreshadowing. 
Well, why an ark? I mean, that's like flood territory. You wouldn't do that again. Sheesh, 0 for 2 on Noah episodes. You know, I actually kind of liked the first Minnesota Cuke, but this follow-up feels lamer in pretty much every way. For one thing, half the stuff in this episode is just a repeat of the first one. They don't get a new villain, it's just Rattan's evil twin, also played by Mr. Lunt? Uh, sure, why not? The twist is the same, with the villain finding out the artifact doesn't grant any powers because it's actually God who has power, and that's probably the most noticeable thing done worse. It kinda made sense with Samson's hairbrush. He had strength, and when his hair was cut, he lost it. But why did you think Noah's umbrella would give you powers? What powers did Noah even have? Also, the search for Samson's hairbrush was a play on the silly song, Where Is My Hairbrush? They didn't even change the title. You couldn't have called it The Hunt For or The Mystery Of Noah's Umbrella? Or even like, Raiders of Noah's Ark? That one writes itself. No, gotta be, and the search for Bible characters' possession. There is some good stuff, mostly when they take inspiration from Last Crusade, like having him pick from all the umbrellas or opening on a flashback. I kinda like Bob and Larry's kid designs. Thank you so much for using them sparingly. Speaking of where is my hairbrush, the silly song in this one sounds a little like it. Not exactly, I'll let it slide, especially since Nezer gets a pretty good verse, but I still think it's below average. Larry has to drink from a sippy cup, and I just feel like they're infantilizing him a little too much. A silly adult is funnier than basically a toddler. Honestly, it was kind of funny trying to imagine Harrison Ford in some of the situations Minnesota finds himself in. No fear! <laughs> I'd know that scream anywhere. Not an altogether awful episode, but there's very little I like all that much. The inferior Minnesota cuke by a wide margin. Attention all fairy tale things. Your welcome is officially worn out. <sighs> this one is fine. Not all that good, but I feel like we've gotten so so many episodes in a row that are just <sighs> fine. The creepy pigs from Princess and the Pop Star return, but now they're millennials, and honestly, I think I'm more okay with them here. Just please don't bring them back again. They do a Three Little Pigs take on the story of the wise man who built his house upon a rock. You may recall this story is short enough to fit into a single Sunday School song, so they pad the runtime with pointless hot tub antics. Then they do a Mother Goose inspired story about a town of nursery rhyme characters learning they need to be nice neighbors. Yeah, these two don't really share morals. Literally the letter is just like, Hey, do a parable. It almost feels like a compilation of two unrelated nursery rhyme episodes, except they came out on the same tape. The silly song is also just fine. But see, that's the problem. It's not totally bad, but it's still just not that good an episode. Frankly, I think the episode's a good reflection of why Veggie Tales declined in quality later on. Early in its life, it was an all-ages program. But by this point, the show was pretty much just for little, little kids. And I mean, that is the age I started watching the show at, but all ages includes little, little kids without excluding older audiences. And that's really the downfall of the series. It never got corporate or or annoying or repetitive, it just slowly became a show more and more targeted at a younger audience more than anyone else. And this is that in action. It's not bad, just clearly directed at an audience I am not. I mean, it's about nursery rhymes. This is here to put your toddler to sleep. Why am I reviewing this? The coach would have put me in fourth quarter. We'd have been state champions, no doubt. No doubt in my mind.
They can't seem to decide if this is a Christmas special or not. It's in some of the Christmas boxes, but not all of them. It mostly takes place at Christmas, like It's a Wonderful Life, the film upon which it's based, with a bit of a Polar Express flair to make it feel really Christmassy. But the Christmas episodes have all had special Christmas wraparounds. This is just Bob and Larry on the counter like usual, no mention of Christmas at all. I'm gonna call it not a Christmas episode, because the Christmas episodes were mostly good. Subverting the usual It's a Wonderful Life trope, Larry wishes to change the past rather than for his own non-existence. After missing the winning touchdown, Stuart, eh, real clever, gets to live out Uncle Rico's fantasy. Despite the subversion, it's exactly what you'd expect with very little to make it stand out. Not particularly funny, though it has its moments, no lessons we haven't learned a hundred times before, the music's fine, which is honestly kind of an insult. Well, okay, Junior's silly song was pretty good, I'm glad they're branching out on who gets to do silly songs, and they don't even feel the need to make a whole bit about it. But everything else is just so underwhelming. Not awful, it does what it needs to, I guess, but it does not not justify its 50 minute runtime. So anyway, here's a fan theory. I've always thought of the vegetables in this as an acting troupe putting on all these performances, kind of like how the Muppets are, but chronologically, Petunia first appears, then a little while after we get Baby Larry, and now there's two little Larrys and one of them's older, and the other looks different. The implication seems to be Petunia joined the show because she married Larry, and then they got their kids in on it too. That is it. That is all I got out of this boring episode. It's not even that entertaining a fan theory. Merry Christmas, everyone. Hey, wait a second. You're not Charles Dickens. Ah, yes. The obligatory Christmas Carol episode. On Easter. I thought I was getting this confused with Star of Christmas, but turns out this is a sequel to Star of Christmas, so that would explain the confusion. I definitely prefer Star of Christmas. How did both Easter episodes tie themselves to that one? This is so derivative, but at the same time, it does so much different, it almost feels like they should have just written their own original thing. Star of Christmas was original. I do like that they've made Mr. Nezer love Easter, just not, you know, the important parts of Easter. You know, from the Christian perspective, I was sort of under the impression the important part of Easter was breeding like rabbits in an orgiistic tribute to the life goddess, but, you know, your thing's cool too, I guess. Mr. Nezer is running a factory to make that Easter staple... Plastic eggs? W what happened to the bunnies? His grandmother loved Easter, so he wants to build Easterland to make it Easter year round and keep grandma alive. Right on top of the church his grandmother loved to go to on Easter. So Nezer has to learn the true meaning of Easter from this human angel girl. And that's where things fall apart. The fun part of a Christmas Carol adaptation is seeing the ways they adapt the ghosts, and I'm just not into this one. They go out of their way to say ghosts aren't real, so I guess I get making it just an angel, but why was she not allowed to be a vegetable? So of course, he learns the true meaning of Easter, Christmas Carol style. Then there's this weird climactic ending where the factory's gonna blow up that totally doesn't fit a Christmas Carol, but okay, epic climax, I guess. It's also not all that funny, which drags it down even more. Maybe that's part of why I don't like the Angel Girl. If it were Bob and Larry doing some Christmas Carol material, it could be really funny, but this is so stone-faced, I'm just not into it. I mentioned in some of my Christmas reviews how I'd only see them once a year, but this one wasn't even an every Easter episode. There were definitely years I skipped this one. Even my fallback compliment doesn't work. There's only two songs that stand out that much, and both kinda turn to Nezer villain songs by the end. Nezer always being the one who learns a lesson is getting kinda old too. It feels like he learns the same thing every time. How many times, old man? Did you even pay him? I gave him an annual pass to Easterland. A 10% off at of the gift shop. It's not an altogether bad episode, just weaker than most. Kind of insane that VeggieTales is 0 for 2 on Easter episodes. The farm is what gives us our power. It's a kind of a field that creates all edible things. 
Veggies in Space, The Fennel Frontier. F f fennel is a vegetable. There is no fennel in this episode, but you know, they make puns about vegetables they aren't, so who even cares? I sure don't. When it's time to learn about sharing, they do a Star Trek parody. You guys already did a Star Trek parody. It was episode three. It's not even a nice, neat bookend. It's the third episode and the fourth from last episode. If it were at least the first and last episodes, that'd be something. Actually, this isn't just a Star Trek parody. They reference Star Wars and Doctor Who and Avatar and Alien. Dude, Alien Egg, you ate that? It was for research. Whoa, something's really kicking in there. When they discover a deposit of unobtainium, Niwantium! Whatever, a fight breaks out between factions. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Spark begins to suspect the crew as being a little too selfish. It's unbearably lame, but it at least has some costumes I like. I mean, on top of Bob and Larry as Spock and Kirk as a couple on vacation. I also like that Petunia's character is implied to be Captain Cuke's ex and they don't rekindle at all. Very Kirk to have random alien exes across the galaxy. So yeah, I mean, it's a more faithful Star Trek parody than the one they did before, but Star Trek is such an obvious reference and the episodes about sharing, which is one of the most overdone morals in kids shows, there are better VeggieTales episodes about it, that's for sure. And the jokes in this one all just sort of fall flat. There's nothing in this I find particularly fun or memorable. The Space Cowboy Silly Song has some catchy music, but it's actually more a medley of four or five Space Cowboy songs. Some original, some not. I think any one of these could have been broadened into a better song. Some people call me the Space Cowboy. But I don't think this Star Trek episode was really strong enough to stand on its own. Maybe shortened with another segment might have made for a better episode, but even then, I think this one would be kinda weak. I don't know, I don't care that much about this one, it's just so nothing. God, so many of these are just so nothing. Let's go, more nothing, give it to me. Alright everyone, chill. Ha, more like the League of Edible Vegetables because they're food. The fourth and final Larry Boy episode, though I'm tempted to not count it as such because the other three are really good and this one is lame. It's not an awful episode or anything. I'm sure kids probably liked it, but it's got nothing on the other three. It's interesting to see the different eras of superhero films influencing these Larry Boy episodes. The first two are Burton's Batman, the third is Raimi's Spider-Man, and this is The Avengers. Please don't take that as a compliment to the episode or an insult to the Avengers. Junior is scared and has to learn God will protect him, something we did in episode one. Meanwhile, the League of Incredible Vegetables fight the evil Dr. Flurry, an ice-based villain with a noticeable lack of ice puns. What killed the dinosaurs? Guys, Actually, this even opens in a museum. Truly, the Batman and Robin of the Larry Boy series. Although at least Batman and Robin is fun, it's my second favorite of the series. Ironically, for a villain who's supposed to represent fear, he's easily the least intimidating villain of the Larry Boy saga. He's also the least distinct. The fib and the rumor weed weren't vegetables at all, and the bad apple was a fruit we hadn't actually seen before. I was actually worried looking at the box the villain was gonna be that bully squash and there's really nothing separating him from the likes of Oscar the Polish caterer. And I get his penguins are a throwback to the toy that saved Christmas, but whenever they're on screen, I can't help but think of the penguins of Madagascar. And you know what else he has a noticeable lack of? Villain songs. Uh, okay, I have to correct myself in the edit here. It turns out he did have a villain song, but it was so forgettable I had forgotten it by the end of the episode and thus wrote that he did not have a villain song in my review. Honestly, the music is severely lacking here. At a point, VeggieTales started letting popular Christian or country music acts write their end credits songs, and while it's led to a few comedic moments of tonal whiplash, I generally don't mind it because it's all kept to the end credits. 
This episode does the League of Incredible Vegetables theme a great disservice by playing it in the actual episode. Like the episode, it's not a terrible song, just kind of lame and underwhelming. And even more to its disadvantage, it's an episode where people are expecting the iconic Larry Boy theme song. It's not even in the same League of Incredible Vegetables. Yeah, see, you're playing it like this. League of Incredible Vegetables. When ordinarily it goes like this. This is the first Larry Boy episode to have a silly song, and it's not very good. And otherwise, they don't sing. I think an in-house League of Incredible Vegetables song would have done a lot for this episode. But I guess it's cool to see other characters as superheroes, and they do all have unique abilities. But they just kind of play it like the League of Incredible Vegetables has always existed, and I think it'd have been cool to see them form the League, especially since Petunia already had a role in the Larry Boy universe, and they don't really add much to the episode comedically or story-wise. It really wouldn't be that different if it was just Larry Boy solo. This is another good example of the show getting too kiddy. The Larry Boy episodes were always some of the most mature episodes of the series, back when it was truly for all ages. This is mostly just for little, little kids. And like, Fair enough, kids will probably enjoy this. I am not a kid, and yet I still enjoy the first three Larry Boy episodes, even the one I didn't grow up with. This is the show's downfall exemplified. I'm partially doing it in the key of A minor myself. <laughs> Yes, I'm the baby Jesus. Okay, so the series is 0 for 2 on Easter, but Christmas I'd say is 3 and a half for 5? That's 70%. That's a passing grade. The, this is the fifth one. The, the, the one that's not as good. And even then, it's a step above an Easter carol. It's definitely the weakest Christmas episode, but it's not totally worthless. It did give me the biggest laugh out of any episode I hadn't already seen. What do you call the guy who forgot to pay his taxes? Bernie! That's me, Bernie. I forgot to pay my taxes. But overall, I'd say it's a below average episode. It does a Princess Bride framing device, and the story is basically just the Rankin Bass little drummer boy just straying much closer to the biblical element. It's got VeggieTales sense of humor, so it's not a complete ripoff, I don't think, but it's less than original. And a few good jokes aside, there's really nothing here I feel strongly about. The Silly Song is a re-recording of a song they did on their 96 Christmas tape, which I only know I had because when Larry mentioned Oscar the Polish Caterer, I went, Wow, I can't believe they brought that character back. What a deep cut. Wait, was he even on the show before? Yeah, I had this cassette tape as a kid. They just took an old song they already had and made an animated version of it. And they thought I wouldn't notice. I really shouldn't have noticed. And also, it's just a bad version of 12 Days of Christmas. They graciously made it 8 instead of 12, but it's still longer than you actually want to listen to. It truly is the Christmas version of 99 bottles of beer on the wall. So yeah, a bad silly song. Also kinda messed up that they're eating peppers when Saint Nicholas himself is a pepper. Just a very underwhelming Christmas special. Despite some good moments, all four other ones are much better. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a good feather. Esther, the girl who became queen, was always a strange episode to me. It doesn't have the Bob and Larry wraparound segments. In fact, it's the first episode without Bob the Tomato. There's no silly song. It's trying very hard to be cinematic, breaking the 30-minute mark. And it's a real mixed bag. See, VeggieTales does straight but humorously anachronistic retellings of Bible stories like Dave and the Giant Pickle and fully stylized retellings of Bible stories set in a different genre, like Little Joe. Esther is a mostly biblical retelling, but with this kind of mobster thing going on with Haman and pretty much just Haman. There's some background characters on this kind of Goodfellas narration. A wise man once said not to be afraid of greatness. I don't mind that, actually, but I almost wish they had gone all the way with it. Make a full-on mob movie parody. Veggie Tales: The Godfather. 
I guess it's easier to explain why a king is allowed to just dump his wife and recruit a new one off the street than a mob boss, but I don't know, you did David and Bathsheba with rubber ducks, you could do a lower stakes version of this with a slick mob movie painted over it. The message here feels way off. It's okay if a guy just kidnaps you off the street and forces you to marry him, because maybe God is using you to avert the Holocaust? Wait, is it okay to let a woman get forced into marriage to avert the Holocaust? I don't know, I'd trade one happy marriage for six million Jews. Okay, checks out. Straight up, Haman is anti-Semitic. That's just what the Bible story is about. Over here talking about there are those who can't be trusted. We know what you mean. I love when the chorus comes back with that though. There are those who can't be trusted. Oh, except they mean Haman. Haman's the one who can't be trusted. Feels like there's a lot more death in this one than usual. Sure, they replace execution with the much sillier island of perpetual tickling, but the peas still try to murk Xerxes. But honestly, the worst thing about this episode is just Esther. You dedicated all this effort into being more cinematic and you didn't focus on any of the regular cast? Instead it's this girl we've never seen before and incidentally never see again because she feels out of place. She's an unidentifiable vegetable that's vaguely humanoid. She's got realistic hair and lips and her eyes are so small. She looks better on the box where you can't see the whites. It just seems like she has dot eyes. The whites in her eyes just make it so wrong. She looks like a parody of a VeggieTales character. And she's not like funny. I'm not insulting her humor. She has no humor. It reeks of a room full of men who were told to make something for little girls who have no idea what little girls like and are ignoring the fact that little girls like what they normally put out. Compare her to Petunia, introduced a few episodes later. She does run into some of the same pitfalls, looking too human, and I think she's robbed of the comedic spotlight a bit too often. But she's got the big cartoony eyes and a much lighter edge to her. Esther is just a downer the whole episode. A and I mean, yeah, she was kidnapped and forced to marry a complete stranger, but you could give her a few lighter moments. She doesn't even get a fun song like Madame Blueberry did. Her song is this dramatic ballad about how God will protect you. Sure, Petunia's still clearly pandering to little girls, but the difference is, I think little girls would like Petunia. And I think that's pretty clearly evidenced by her becoming a recurring character, while Esther just sort of disappeared after this episode. Esther is trying too hard. Petunia is trying just enough. Yeah, I have a lot to say about this one. It's just such an unusual episode. What works about it really works, and I appreciate the attempt to mix things up. But I don't like the central figure of the episode, and that pulls it down a lot. Not a bad episode, one with plenty going for it, and I sort of applaud their attempt to mix it up a bit, but one with a few major issues that are holding it back. He threw a pie in my face! <laughs> you can't beat the classics. Dang, that's some well-animated water. And some really bad mashed potatoes. Duke and the Great Pie War introduces Petunia, the female character who stuck. And I think it's one of her weakest episodes, in no small part because she's a princess who needs saving. Not the last time she'd be a princess either. Yeah, I don't hate Petunia, I actually like her a little better than Esther because she's not a constant downer. But she never escaped feeling like... the girl. And like I said, I think they're ignoring that little girls already liked VeggieTales. They've had two other female characters I think worked. Heck, this episode proves that Laura Carrot can carry her own segment. Why can't she be the girl? I really tried to like Petunia when I was a kid. By this point I was watching Jimmy Neutron, I had accepted that there could be good, fun female characters, but Petunia just never clicked with me, and this rewatch did very little to change that. She certainly gets off to a bad start. They imply she's a rhubarb? 
Rhubarbs are red with green tops. You, you got the colors wrong. But then I'm not sure she's actually supposed to be a rhubarb. I mean, I can complain about this character, but there's stuff I like about the episode. We learn the importance of caring for family, starting with the story of Moses and the river. I don't think these are the models they've used for Laura's parents previously, but I kind of like the idea of her being Jewish. Then we get the story of Ruth, restylized as a medieval fairy tale. They even tie it back to King George and the Rubber Ducky by including the Pie War and making the MacGuffin Amulet a duck. Wait a minute, pies and ducks? Get out of here, Hugh! It's a decently funny episode, they get some good ones in. How many Rhubarbarians does it take to change a light bulb? I don't know. How many Rhubarbarians? Uh, what's a light bulb? I don't know, but if I did, I'm sure it would not change my negative opinion of Rhubarbarians. <laughs> and characters are dead in this one. Like, it doesn't make sense if they aren't. And Larry's Brothers is one of the funniest jokes on the show. Just everything about their inclusion is amazing. Bob the Cucumber? I would have remembered if you had a brother named Bob. Oh, well... Sorry, I guess I never thought about it when I was around you. But outside of a few good jokes, this one doesn't have much going on. Both stories are on the weaker side, even if I like Laura getting the spotlight. Even the silly song is just... okay. Don't love it, don't hate it. The only interesting thing is that it introduces Petunia. And Larry's brothers. Man, I love Larry's brothers. Abed, true to form, has decided to do the weird thing and film a documentary. You know, forgetting the title of the episode, the Abraham stuff takes up very little of the episode, both because the second segment is longer and because his segment really tests your patience. But in a good way, kinda, because today we're learning about patience. So Bob and Junior try making a documentary about Abraham, only for there to be a lot of technical issues. Then, in a segment that feels like maybe it's a parody of something, though I can never figure out what, I, I think it might be completely original, Larry plays an inventor who always does a slapdash job, usually to disastrous results, and must learn to take his time in building inventions, and in everything else in life. It's fun to do a documentary style thing, but I think the second segment is the stronger of the two. I just kind of like it when they do something original, and this is a cute little story where everyone wears funny little outfits. Oh, and they finally bring Ma Grape back to be Sarah, her second appearance after only 30 episodes. This is a perfectly fine episode in a long string of perfectly fine episodes. I really don't have much to say about these segments. But you know what I do have something to say about? The Sneeze Doctor. This is the worst silly song. And I don't mean it's a weaker one that's still a little catchy, like Biscuit of Sansa Mirandigo. This one barely rhymes, I forgot the tune instantly, and it reminded me of that stupid sneezing minigame in Tomodachi Life. Nintendo, bring back Tomodachi Life, that game was so good, just, just leave out the dumb sneeze game. What was I talking about? Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter? Uh, yeah, it was kind of funny, but uh, I wish I'd committed to the joke a little harder. Not bad for a girl. Hey, that was pretty good for Rambo. Ugh, this episode is for girls. I don't want to watch the girl episode. Just as I was thinking about how Petunia has been around for 13 episodes and we've never seen her out of character once, she shows up to find Larry trying to find a good look to no success. This girl calls in and is just like, Hi Petunia, hi Annie, as if anyone knows the name of this character who disappeared half the series ago without looking it up. I've been watching this show for 27 years and I don't know her name. I, I mean, it's Annie, she just said it. But I'll forget it again. Her problem is that she feels ugly because other kids made fun of her. I'm calling out repeat morals, but you've already done that one twice. In fact, wait, in the third episode. Have you ever seen a boy with funny clothes, a girl with braces, braces on, on her teeth, teeth and freckles on her nose? Okay, that one was about not making fun of people, this one's about getting made fun of. But even Noah's Umbrella, a lesser episode in my opinion, justifies itself more. It's more about being made fun of for being Christian. This one, meanwhile, just does a snoodle's tail but for girls, to really draw attention to the fact that they have basically the same moral. Except in that, the boy 
Miss Noodle meets his actual creator. In Snoodlerella, she meets a king, and the king fills the same role and has the same voice as the creator. Bad VeggieTales. Stop deifying royalty. Sweet Pea Beauty I was kinda okay with, though. Despite its title, it's mostly a take on Snow White, although they make sure to reference Rapunzel and Little Red Riding Hood as well. Honestly, you know what this reminds me of? Those straight-to-video Barbie princess movies. They're doing a princess story, but with a little twist. There's a cute animal sidekick, I think Barbie's even done a skunk before, and in this telling, the magic mirror is the villain, which feels like the type of thing a Barbie movie might do. Early on, I went, LMAO, bro thinks he's the fib, but nah, this dude is legitimately out for blood. I order you to let that girl go! As you wish. Wait! Honestly, he's the reason this is ranked as highly as it is. I love him so much. But I'm not sure I understand his plan. I think the implication is this city votes once a year on who's the best looking, and the winner gets to be queen? Except you're allowed to exile people for being better looking, which feels like cheating and also a metaphor for capitalism and he wants to get rid of Sweet Pea so the queen can win and he can keep manipulating her, but also he gives her a drink knowing it will make her ugly? Also, this whole your appearance doesn't matter, it's what's on the inside that counts message paired with a character's appearance changing to match what's on the inside is always a self-defeating trope. How you look is fine, except if someone has an ugly soul, their soul looks like you. A confused episode, but a fairly entertaining one. I'd understand someone who didn't enjoy this one, though. It's got a lot of problems. Honestly, for how girl-centric they went, I'm surprised we didn't get a more feminine silly song. This pants song is actually quite catchy, but why is Jimmy yellow? Did they give him the wrong texture? What's going on? He looks fine in the later segment. Honestly, something's just off about the animation in this episode. There's just, like, textures missing everywhere. It looks like the pre-final render before you go in and fix everything. What happened? Did they just run out of time with this one? I gotta rank this below Snoodle's Tale. It's a Snoodle's Tale, but slightly worse, and I don't like the other segment near as much as Dr. Jiggle and Mr. Sly, but it's still got plenty going for it. Let my pickles go! They've updated the clips in the theme song, so this is the official beginning to the I Had Stopped Watching era. Although I might have seen this one once. The Lone Stranger song rings a bell, and I think this is where I've heard of Coal Snakes from. This episode is a sequel to Little Joe, something they make sure you know like a dozen times before the actual episode starts. It makes sense, Moses was a descendant of Joseph, it is part of the same story, but adapting the story of Moses to the Old West has some strange implications, like that there were actually slaves in the Old West, ones who maybe even leaned in on Moses imagery in some of their songs, who saw their struggle as similar to that of the Israelites in Egypt. I'm just not sure I'm okay with the implication that Larry the Cucumber and Archibald Asparagus are black. Especially not after the Moses rap. That sounds fake. This sounds like a parody of a VeggieTales episode. But no, this is real. Utterly embarrassing silly song aside, this is an okay episode. I have issues with it, but my biggest one is just that it's too long. I appreciate that at some point they said, forget the 30 minute time limit, we make them as long as we want. But this one should have been a lot closer to 30 minutes. And I think I kind of honed in on something I don't like about Petunia. She's always Larry's love interest, but because every episode is a new story, they never have any development. They're always meeting for the first time. Again. In this one, they at least get to bang. But Petunia doesn't do anything past the halfway mark because they needed to tell a lot less of Moses' story. That's not Petunia's fault, though. There's an episode's worth of good material in here, but they really needed to trim the fat. You Scott sure are a contentious people. You just made an enemy for life! McLarry is a really solid episode. 
for when it came out in the series. I mean, it at least held my attention, which at this point wasn't always a guarantee. It has, like jokes and humor some of it doesn't land but plenty of it does and just when you think they're gonna do another hey don't worry about bullies because god loves you episode scooter tells a tale about how sometimes god makes people different for different reasons which is kind of what his first episode was about but this is more focused on what if you're the one who's different and mclary is certainly neurodivergent coded would you believe me if I told you VeggieTales is very popular with autistic people? Larry's father, Chog Norius, yes, it's a Chuck Norris joke, is in a prank war with Pompous Maximus, but his son is only interested in inventing and decides to strike out on his own when he can't live up to his father's expectations. Yeah, it's a mid-tier episode, but compared to the stuff it was releasing around, it's a noticeable step up. And that's a bit of a compliment to the quality of the show. Even at its worst, it was still capable of putting out a mid-tier episode. Of course, they do a Scottish silly song we feel so smart in our red tartan scottish kills larry you're not allowed to say that anymore what will the autistic kids think are there better episodes yes but i appreciate this one if only because it saved me from having to figure out how to say the episode was fine but underwhelming for the 52nd time Look, I like the Christmas Jesus best, and I'm saying grace. Oh boy, another Christmas episode. I wonder what the true meaning of Christmas will be this time. I bet it's Christmas lights. Figure this out. First 33 episodes, two-thirds of the series, two Christmas episodes. Final third of the series, three Christmas episodes. Four if you count it to Meaningful Life, but let's not. This one brings in special guest star Cy Robertson, the crazy uncle from Duck Dynasty. He is either the worst part or the best part of the episode, I can't tell which. And getting a VeggieTales cameo is way cooler than the other one that cameoed in God's Not Dead. And guess who did the tonally inappropriate end credits song? Toby Mac and, I am not joking, Owl City. You would not believe your eyes if 10,000 Christmas lights... Duck Dynasty and Owl City. Two things that are popular in 2014 and surely always will be. Yeah, this is an extremely mid-2010s episode. It's also an extremely mid-episode. Mary Larry, the guy who works as an elf at the mall year-round, meets a little girl and, uh stalks her home because I guess she told him about Jesus. It seems like this is something he's familiar with at first, but later it kind of feels like this is maybe the first time he's hearing about Jesus. Then they help an old woman save her home for Christmas. And also Bob, who's been contracted to decorate a mall for Christmas, puts up a nativity scene, and it's not some crazy war on Christmas defiant act against the secular oppressors. The owner of the mall just shows up and goes, yeah, it's cool, I'm Christian too. Also, he's the king of the mall. Capitalism joke. So I said they're three and a half for five with Christmas episodes. This is the half. It's kinda good. There's stuff I kinda like about it, but there's also stuff I kinda don't. Which makes it comparatively better than Drummer Boy, though not by much. Princess, from an episode we haven't gotten to yet, returns, and you know the theory about this being an acting troupe? Yeah, the woman playing her mom is clearly not actually her mom. This is what Esther looks like now that she's in her late 30s. Also, Mitzi kept bugging me about whether the vegetables think of Jesus as a human or a vegetable, but their nativity scene uses human Jesus, so there you go, he was a human. And the silly song is about wrapping your pickle for Christmas. It's my in a box. It reeks of late era Veggie Tales, especially to people who've stopped watching the show. I've seen a lot of people gawk at the Duck Dynasty guy being in this one, but I admit it's not as bad as it seems from the outset. It's kinda okay. Father, when can I leave to be on my own? Furry vegetables! We got furry vegetables, everyone! The show gets a makeover with a new theme song and a redesigned countertop. It's not the version I grew up on, so I don't like it. Actually, they get video messages from kids now, and there's a good reason they didn't do that before. These kids can't act. 
the episode's all right. I think it's a pretty solid adaptation of Pinocchio, if only because it is laser focused on being a clear and concise morality tale. Moralizing runs very deep in my family. I think my biggest problem is it feels like we're retreading a lot of ground. We've learned about honesty and prodigal son stories and getting eaten by a whale with a bug. Yeah, I'd probably like this one better if it were an older episode. It's decent, just a tad repetitive. Obligatory mention of how good the music still is. This has to be one of the most boring topics for a silly song, but they still went needlessly hard with it. I kind of like that they brought Khalil back, and the wood texture on Pistachio is pretty good, but I don't know that I have a lot to say about this one. Not a bad episode, but hardly the best either. <laughs> At first I was like, oh boy, crazy disco episode, and then it turned into the most inane cliche garbage. The park is being closed down so they can build a parking lot and we gotta get the band back together, but oh no, Junior and Laura aren't friends anymore. It's got nothing to do with Saturday Night Fever, though I guess that would be hard to adapt into a Veggie Tales episode. People only remember the big disco dance scene. That movie gets dark. One of these tropes would be on the nose, but a good enough setup for an episode. All three just feels like they're trying too hard. But it was kinda a cute episode, and most of the music, which there is a lot of, was pretty good. The weak link, I think, is Laura's wake up pop tune, though I like that it's about something as silly as checking boxes. I don't particularly like Laura's redesign. The glasses are fine, but give her back the braids. Then again, she never actually appears like this again because this was two episodes before the show ended. I do think she carries the episode pretty well, even if it is going in some of the most obvious directions imaginable. I just kinda like seeing more of her and Junior's relationship. Oh, and Terry Crews guest stars as an onion who gets this really solid villain song. I'm gonna tear it I like him. This episode also brings back Khalil and kinda makes me wanna ship him and Archibald. Oh yes, Big Daddy Al was a groovy brother. <laughs> His name is Big Daddy Al. I am only mentioning the silly song out of obligation because it is so very forgettable and unnoteworthy, especially in this very music heavy episode. Kinda lame, but there is plenty in there working for it. Also, Mr. Nezer appears at the end out of costume, and I know Larry doesn't wear clothes, but Nezer always has, and he just looks naked. I'm uncomfortable. It's useless now. Kelly Pickler guest stars as Larry's daughter, and they don't even make a pickle joke. Although they make a vegetable pun in the title, and look at that, they actually have that vegetable in the story. And he's voiced by, of all people, Rob Paulson, the voice actor behind Carl Weezer, and like every other cartoon character, which is so much weirder than Kelly Pickler. They got a few celebrity guests after they got bought out by DreamWorks, but Paulson is not really a celebrity, at least not on the scale of Kelly Pickler or Terry Crews. Usually VeggieTales goes in-house for voice actors, so this is kind of an odd appearance. I'm a cranky old grump with a nasty voice. Also, hilariously, they keep calling him Mr. Beat. Mr. Beat, Mr. Beat, Mr. Beat, Mr. Beat. And I could complain that it's another frickin' princess episode, but honestly, I kind of do like the ways they've differentiated themselves from the typical Beauty and the Beast story. Like, Beauty isn't a prisoner in the Beast's castle. She and her Christian music family get trapped at a hotel in the snow. And instead of putting a curse on the castle, the woman the Beat turns away just 
gave them a bad review because magic isn't allowed on Veggie Tales. Unfortunately, pretty much all the music is sung by Pickler, who hews closer to her own style than Veggie Tales, but not quite close enough, and it ends up sounding like just very generic contemporary Christian music. Also, can we talk about how often this show makes the girl character just unambiguously kind, loving, and Christian. Laura's really the only one consistently screwing up the way the male characters do. Strangely, two episodes I didn't particularly like, Esther and Twas the Night Before Easter, do at least let the female character make mistakes and learn from them, and they tell that story very poorly, so maybe they're better off just letting the ladies be perfect. Except Laura. I, I guess putting her closer to the target audience age, they feel more comfortable making her face problems a kid would have. I guess this one does contrast Beauty with her selfish sisters, which is actually more accurate to the book than the Disney movie. Though I guess it's something you'd want to include if you're going for the morality angle. Just a strange episode, though that makes it more memorable than some. It's something. I think Rob Paulson does really good, and Kelly Pickler... Eh. Bob fanboying is kinda weird. His eyes get big and he rolls around creepily. It shows off a side of Bob that's interesting, but not one I think I was prepared for. The Silly Song is funny in concept, but this one needed another pass through the writer's room. It doesn't quite land. There is stuff in here I'm not fond of, though nothing I really hate. Oh, and apparently this is also a Christmas episode. They decorate for Christmas at one point, and it ends with Kelly Pickler singing Deck the Halls with the Veggie Tales, which is a weirdly secular Christmas song pick. Also, they change the gay apparel line. Odd episode, but not a terrible one. I liked the part where a helicopter showed up. I'm not so good with the rhyming. Not really. In a kind of meta opening, Larry returns from overused literary adaptation camp to tell us a Jekyll and Hyde parody about Jerry as Dr. Jiggle being too fat to disco dance, so he puts on a super tight outfit and dances as Mr. Sly. Then we get a Dr. Seuss parody about a snoodle who gets made fun of and weighed down by others' ridicule. But then he meets God, and God tells him he's good and cool, actually. I somehow feel like I've seen the Dr. Jiggle and Mr. Sly segment more than a Snoodle's Tale. Maybe I'd watch that, then just turn the tape off? Or maybe I've seen them both the same amount, and a Snoodle's Tale is just way more forgettable. You guys already did a Dr. Seuss parody in the third episode. A and yeah, it's just the story of the Good Samaritan, but it's a good story. I like the story of Flibber Lou a lot. A Snoodle's Tale does a decent job emulating Seuss, but it's almost too Seuss see not veggie tales enough plus this was when i was kind of outgrowing veggie tales so this very saccharine toddler story never clicked with me as a kid i appreciate it more now in part because of the more inventive visuals but i think it's a weaker segment and yet it's attached to a brilliant segment. I love Dr. Jiggle and Mr. Sly. I am now disappointed the 70s never gave us a disco Jekyll and Hyde, but Veggie Tales delivers. I want desperately to make a super gay, super camp, Phantom of the Paradise style Jekyll and Hyde disco musical about learning to accept yourself, but deep down I would always know it was a ripoff of a Veggie Tales episode. And also, it's not the 70s. Ah! What? The hand! What? That joke is so funny, at least in part because it is genuinely unnerving. I think they've started to miss more often, but stuff like this proves they haven't completely fallen off yet. After a pretty queer segment, they have to straighten things out by giving us the whitest love song ever about driving your SUV to the gas station for Fritos and wild fantasies where the kind of impractical thing you own saves the day. I like your car. I like yours too. Is it a cheap? Subaru! 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 A mixed bag where I can't say anything is bad, but some things are clearly weaker than others. It's a great opening segment, an okay silly song, and a serviceable second segment. You're an orphan now! Congratulations! 
happens. Okay, in the last seven episodes, we've gotten three For the Girl episodes. This one even introduces a new girl character that's not the five other little girl characters they already have. Not that I have a problem with this character. I like her more than Esther and even Petunia. I almost wish she had been introduced sooner. Although since she's playing Larry's kid, why not bring back his daughter from It's a Meaningful Life? Ah, oh, well, I like her better than that girl too. Princess is sent to a girl's school while her father's away in the military where she becomes friends with a servant. And then Larry dies. They say he died. They don't sugarcoat it at all. My man is dead. For all the times they danced around it in Bible stories, to just have it in this seemingly original story is kind of a shock to the system. Anyways, he lost his fortune too, so Princess now must work as a servant who's in constant trouble with the headmistress. And I love seeing the lost puppies lady get to play a villain in one of these. I think it kinda succeeds where Esther failed. It's the story of a girl thrust from her life into a sad situation where she turns to God for strength. And while I think Esther was perhaps a more complex character, I think that's fixed by the episode's addition of other girls who sort of learned the lessons of the episode. It is another example of the perfect angel girl character. Also, there's some pretty strong gay undertones if you're into that. I'm gonna punish you by taking the girl you like away from you? I mean, come on. Not as good as Sweet Pea Beauty, which wins points for a great villain, but it's way better than Snoodlerella. That's a problem I have with ranking this one. How do I rank something I think was decent the entire time against episodes with one segment I really liked and one segment I really didn't? I honestly feel kind of weird about how high this one is ranked. Not particularly funny, a little too saccharine, and there's episodes with better music. But I don't know, it holds to a consistent level of quality, which is more than I can say for some of these other episodes. Yes, there's lots of stuff I've ranked below this that hits higher highs, but they also all hit lower lows too. And if this is your slightly below average episode, you must have a pretty solid show going on, because this... This is not bad at all. I will say, while I've enjoyed them giving silly songs to characters besides Larry, I don't know that Laura Carrot really needs one, especially since the joke is just, little girls use text talk. But hey, they brought back getting letters from kids instead of the not very good video introductions. Far from bad, far from the best. Completely adequate. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! The very first episode of Veggie Tales, and I gotta say, off to a weird start. The show hadn't quite found its footing, I admit. In the first segment, Bob and Larry just show up in Junior's room, plopping in from nowhere. Did God send them? It really doesn't help that the message is about being scared. This is the roughest the show ever looked and they decided, hey, let's do scary visuals with this bad CG. And man, I kind of forgot how weird the story of Daniel in the lion's den is. Daniel gets his position of power for being the only one who could interpret the king's dreams. It also has this really funny joke that feels way darker than VeggieTales usually gets. We're not- Uh, yeah! You better be lying down, um, cause those lions are gonna, um, lie on you! <laughs> uh, what? Lions are gonna lie on you? They're gonna eat them! They're not gonna lie on them! Well, well, maybe they're gonna lie on them, then eat them. Most show pilots are kinda awkward, and VeggieTales is no exception. But I gotta say, right from the jump, they had the music down. It's a weaker silly song in my opinion, sacrificing the song for a verbal gag, but apparently this was never intended to be something in every episode, so I'll give this one a pass for not really being what the segment usually is. And other than that, every song is great. VeggieTales music is perhaps the most praised aspect of the series, and it's the component that has worked from the very start. If this came out later in the series, I'd probably go harder on it just for how off the whole thing feels, but it's a decent start, I think. Things can only go up from here. Can't go.
God squirt slime out of his ears? I wonder that same thing sometimes. And now it's time for Veggie Sexualities with Matt. The part of the show where Matt comes out and tells you all the VeggieTales characters' sexualities. Alright, I got my Dr. Pepper shirt. I got my Dr. Pepper. Uh, I want to remind everyone that my observations here are uh, completely 100% accurate. This should be taken as absolute canon. Uh, if you disagree with these, you're wrong. Let's start things off. Bob the Tomato is Grey Ace. Like, he's definitely homo-romantic, but I, I don't think he's all that interested in sex. Like, he'll do it for the right partner, but it's, it's not really something that, like, concerns him with a relationship, you know? Uh, Larry the Cucumber is bisexual. If you don't see it, I can't explain it to you. Jimmy Gord is gay. That's maybe not immediately obvious, but you can definitely tell when you see him in stuff like Dr. Jiggle and Mr. Sly or or his work with uh, Boys in the Sink. Jerry, on the other hand, ace as heck. Very food is wife type of guy. Although they are vegetables, so I suppose all of their wives are food. Archibald is the character the show goes the furthest towards saying is actually gay. And to that end, I actually think he's ace, and uh, if you suggested to him that he was gay, he would get on to you for buying into stereotypes. Paw Grape is the sweetest ally. Like, he knows all of his friends are gay, and he loves and accepts them for it. He, he, he truly believes that, like, God has made us all different for different reasons, and that, uh, you know, his gay friends make up this beautiful tapestry of the human race, just as much as he, a heterosexual man, does. So, in some ways, it almost even, like, strengthens his own heterosexuality, just, you know, uh, knowing that everyone's different, that everyone is unique in their own way, and that it's okay for him and his friends to have different sexual tastes. Mr. Lunt doesn't use labels, but if you called him pansexual, he would not disagree with you. Mr. Nezzer's an odd one, like, my gut reaction is to say that that guy's straight, but like, you never see him with any women. I think he's almost like, stealth gay, like one day he just like mentions his husband and you're like, hold up, you're gay? And it's like, well, he, he, he would tell you something like, oh, well, I, I wasn't trying to hide it. It just never came up. But yeah, I, I, I think Mr. Nezer is gay, but he is like very bad at projecting that fact. Madame Blueberry's got some European sensibilities. I, I think she's mainly interested in men. I, I think she probably really only goes for men. But she doesn't think it's weird if she ends up in a situation with a woman that's just, you know, that happens sometimes and she just sort of rolls with it. Jean-Claude and Philippe, the, the, the two French guys who hang out together all the time, who are never seen apart. They're not brothers! Like, Jimmy and Jerry are explicitly brothers. Jean-Claude and Philippe are just two guys who hang out. We'll never know. The children characters I have a hard time with. They haven't, like, fully developed their sexualities yet. Except this one. Except Princess. This is the girl who tells you she's gonna marry her best friend and means it. But j just, just as a little bonus here, uh... Deconverted, deconverted, claims to still be Christian, but really only shows up at, like, Christmas and, and Easter. Super right-wing Christian, militant left-wing Christian. Look at this kid. This kid has, like, three piercings, a shoulder tattoo that he's always showing off because he's always wearing tank tops, and he runs a podcast about being a former Christian child star and, and how he left the faith. Junior's dad is a very specific type of bi guy that I have known, and maybe you have known too. Several times over, in fact. I, I know many bi men like this. J Junior's dad is that bi guy who's kind of flamboyant about it. He's really into musical theater. He uses slang he picked up from RuPaul's Drag Race. But he also didn't realize he was bi until he was in Bible college, and at that point he'd already met a girl he liked, and they got married, and they have a kid, so... He's pretty much living the heterosexual lifestyle, just in the gayest way possible, and you know what, good for him. Junior's mom we don't really see enough of for me to say, but 
instinctually I want to say straight. Petunia is not just heterosexual. I would honestly call Petunia, like, hetero bait? Like, this is a character who got added to the series to make it more heterosexual. S Scooter, I imagine this, like, whole episode with him where he joins the VeggieTales cast and he's all like, Oh, it's so great what you're doing for the lard. But then he, like starts to figure out that all of his castmates are gay and he like freaks out about it because he was like a really homophobic Christian and then like he and probably Paul Grape have to have like a heart to heart about it and in the end he comes around and he he's he's better about it now now that he's been doing this show with you know like an almost all gay cast for the song he's cooler about it just you know at first that that he, he, he had trouble getting used to it, you know? You know what I mean? The Scallion Brothers, uh, gay, gay, bisexual. Also, all three furries. Definitely all three furries. And just because I know you're wondering, Wolf, Fox, Bulldog. The Lost Puppies Lady is an asexual, biromantic trans woman. The Fib's whole race just reproduces asexually. They, they don't know what sex is even. It's, it's not even like he, he doesn't have sexual desire. He doesn't know what sex is. His species doesn't do sex. The bad apple is such a dom that your gender doesn't really matter. In fact, it's almost hotter if it is a woman because that's just like an extra layer of temptation. The rumor weed is homophobic. For those of you who have Dark Side of the Moon, press play now. When Larry worries about coming clean to his dad, Bob tells him a cross between the Wizard of Oz and the Prodigal Son, which leads to not the most accurate adaptation of either story, but it tells its message. Most of the Wizard of Oz jokes are pretty lame. They're just doing random food puns. And even then, they also just have puns about frogs and Ohioans and Pfeifers and mares. What does that have to do with anything? They've replaced the Wicked Witch with Junior's Bully, which fails to tie into either story being told. But otherwise, it's a decent episode. Certainly unique to do a Bible story and a pop culture parody. I wish they would adapt more parables. I think those are strong stories for the veggies to be slotted into. Oh, and the Monkey Ape Silly Song? Banger. This will be stuck in my head for like a week. I also really liked Lunt singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. It's a passable episode, I wouldn't say I loved it. Kind of an overdone parody that I wish was funnier, but far from a bad episode. It's fine. He turns himself into a pickle. Funniest shit I've ever seen. Under disgust that this is the first Larry Boy episode, Larry feels insecure and Bob has to tell him the story of David and Goliath. I don't think it's the strongest episode, but there is quite a bit to like. The music's great, and I don't even just mean the lyrical stuff. Goliath's... Goliath's... Goliath's theme. My god, that's difficult to say. Goliath's theme is killer. Those big, pounding basses. Probably worth slipping in here that I Love My Lips is an absolute A-tier silly song, but it does have its shortcomings. I don't think this one's particularly funny, and if memory serves, that's not a new opinion of mine. I didn't like this one as much as the others as a kid. Not that it doesn't have its moments, David in the Big Armor is an image that stuck with me. It's also kind of a retread of the first episode's God is Bigger message, although I'd say this is the more effective of the two. I also hate to critique the religious angle, but it's odd that Bob basically says, anything can happen if God wants it to, and Larry's response is, that makes me feel special? I guess I get what they're going for, like, we don't have to worry because it's in God's plan, but maybe you should be a little more specific. A step back, I think, from the two episodes that preceded it. I feel weird putting one from the golden era this low. I suppose it is over halfway up the list, but... I don't know, it just never quite did it for me, even if there is a lot I like. Oh yes, I am giving the cat attention. The cat likes to get the attention. Oh, she is getting so much attention. 
Much like the first episode, the show's second episode is pretty different from what the series ended up being. But in this episode's case, I think it actually works a little better. It's way cartoonier than even the very next episode. The sun and trees are alive, something that never happens again. But that style has its charm. Today we learn about forgiveness with Pa Grape along with the rarely seen Ma, Rosie, and Tom Grape. They make fun of this cheese-headed bean boy, but after learning that's mean, they apologize, so Junior must find it in himself to forgive them. Really weird that they have a whole song about being mean only for dad asparagus's you shouldn't do that to instantly win them over. Guess they weren't as mean as the song made it seem. Oh, no, 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 we would not do such a thing as what you have said we would have done, except for maybe we did that, I guess, now that you... Oh, well, okay, we did that. Yep, that's what we did. They also bring up the forgiving someone 70 times 7 Bible verse and give a mathematical answer to it as if the verse meant you have to forgive someone exactly 490 times before you can give up and resent them and not just don't stop forgiving people. The Forgive-O-Matic is a genuinely brilliant piece of anti-corporate satire. It's as easy as this. Just dial up your sin here. Press this button and bingo! God forgives you of your sin. This is better than a lot of silly songs. And speaking of characters who just don't come back, what happened to this potato? What did I mention? They also make great Julian fries. Well, just drop a potato in here, I'll push the button, and, and presto! Out come the best fries you've ever tasted. Uh... I don't like the implications of that. And then Bob and Larry recount the time they did a Gilligan's Island parody and everyone has to learn to forgive Larry. This one goes a little better, showing Bob and Daddy Asparagus, here playing the professor, both having to apologize to others and learn what it's like to be forgiven. Seems like there's less of an abrupt turnaround. And then a Jamaican palm tree shows up out of nowhere and sings about it. Weirdly, I remember him having a second appearance singing Angels We Have Heard On High on their Christmas album. I guess they just wanted to get this singer back for that, but never wanted to reuse this character model since trees stopped being alive after this episode. Anyways, despite its flaws, it's already a step up from Where's God When I'm Scared. I can't say they've perfected the formula yet, but I already see the inklings of a great series. But you just can't go wrong with the Rye or the Kaiser. Okay, what if a Rocky parody, but it's sumo wrestling? in Japan, and the title is a reference to Phantom of the Opera for some reason. God, a VeggieTales Phantom of the Opera would be so good. Oh, and the opening segment has Larry, Jerry, and Lunt dressed as the Three Stooges, even though the silent short they're referencing is a Laurel and Hardy bit. They don't even act like the Three Stooges. And then there's a 2D segment about the real-life guy Saint Patrick. I don't mind the segment, it's pretty well done, fun way to mix things up. An episode with a bit of an identity issue, but I still enjoyed it. The piano segment had really good music, and it's not just the Laurel and Hardy bit, it does enough unique to stand on its own. And the sumo segment is pretty good, even if it feels more like a ripoff of Rocky than a parody. I guess Potato is a pretty good parody of Mr. T. I love this guy, way funnier than T from Jimmy Neutron. Oh, a pity to me. Uh, actually, Mr. T was in Rocky 3. I enjoy VeggieTales' take on Rocky, but there's nothing about this episode I love. It's all good, not great, but pretty good. The silly song is uncharacteristically educational, but in a way that kind of works. It's Larry's version of educational music, like Schoolhouse Rock. Like the rest of the episode, I like it but don't love it. A good but no more than good episode. 
See, Bakshi, you could do all of Lord of the Rings in one movie. VeggieTales did it in 50 minutes. You know, with half as much lore, a third as many characters, and absolutely no battles. Yes, in this parody of Lord of the Rings, Billy Boy receives a magic bean that can create anything, which frankly is way cooler than a ring that can just make you invisible. And he uses his ability to end scarcity to help impoverished people. It's probably like a real world parallel in there, but uh, it's not coming to me. I actually kind of like how they've adapted Lord of the Rings. I'm quite impressed with their ability to condense the series into less than an hour and still work in a message about using your gifts to help people. I don't think the comedy is where it was at in the show's heyday, but I still got laughs out of this, and there weren't any real groaners. I mean, come on, they made the orcs sporks. Comedy gold. Although, what was the point of naming him Iracorn if he's played by a cucumber? It's cool to have Mr. Nezer as the wizened sage instead of the villain for once. And the silly song actually ties into the episode, which is rare. It's, uh... I'm not gonna lie, it's kinda lame. One of the weakest silly songs. Lord of the Beans is an okay episode. Not devoid of good moments, but far from its best. This is the midpoint of the series, episode 25 of 50. And yeah, it feels like a midpoint episode. It's twice as good as half the episodes, and half as good as twice the episodes, or, or something like that. Actually, hold on. I gotta complain about these All the Shows box sets. They've left out all the Silly Song tapes, which is kind of lame, but I, I also kind of understand why that is. Those aren't exactly shows. They've left out Larry's Wonderful World of Autotainment, which makes no sense. That was just a regular episode. It's different, sure. The format's a little strange, but it is an episode of Veggie Tales. You shouldn't have left that one out. But they've also left out Lord of the Beans, and, and it seems like a complete mistake. Like, Larry's Wonderful World of Autotainment at least seems, like, deliberate. Lord of the Beans should either have been at the end of this one or the start of this one, and it's just not. They just completely forgot about this episode. Also, the box set ends at number 36, so uh, this isn't even close to all the shows. At what sort of school did you learn to be a detective? Elementary, my dear Watkins. Elementary. Today we learn the importance of friendship through the story of Don Quixote? Don runs a restaurant but can't compete with the new fast food chain and goes crazy trying to fight it. And his friend literally tells him to get off the sauce. No, Don. What you need is to lay off the salsa. Then Sherlock Holmes is stealing all the credit from Watson and has to learn that that hurts. I'm just realizing now how many episodes boil down to, wow, I wouldn't want someone to do that to me, probably because this one really puts a point on it by adding the golden rule. These are fine. Honestly, we've reached a point in the series where my enjoyment mostly comes from how weird the show gets sometimes. Why did they think Don Quixote was a good story to teach friendship? They didn't even give him a parody name, he's just Don Quixote. I'm not complaining, I honestly love it. They can still pull out some good jokes, but it's a lot fewer than at the show's peak. The music though, still great. And I know I did a whole bit about these characters being gay, but I've kind of left those jokes out of the episode analysis. That said, this is one of Bob and Larry's gayest episodes. The good doctor's been gone all day, suffering from a broken heart he is. I don't know, maybe Sherlock Holmes is just a story that really lends itself to gay undertones. And honest question, why can't Ma Grape be the queen? Did we just forget that there are other members of the Grape family? And I guess here's as good a place as any to say VeggieTales' depiction of other cultures is maybe a little... stereotypical. I said, sorry to interrupt, but the golden roller has been stolen. I also think the Don Quixote segment is maybe a bit unrealistic in its portrayal of how business owners treat attacks on their business. Luckily, the silly song shows a more accurate depiction of rich people. This song is super catchy too. 
overall, there's a few things I don't really like, but for the most part, this is a pretty good episode. Except when Jimmy's voice comes out of Jerry's mouth. So, lads, what's shaking? You thought I wouldn't notice, but I did. Zero out of ten. Worst episode. Little Joe never once gave it away. Little Joe is a retelling of the story of Joseph, the guy with the coat of many colors, here adapted into a western. And this is one of those weird times where the Bible story being adapted kinda drags down the episode. Joseph is kind of an odd Bible story. They open it on Joseph's father clearly playing favorites with Joe to the point you start to resent him, and then Joe's all like, yo, let me tell you about this dream I had where you all bowed down and worshipped me. Get out of here, you spoiled brat. Then in the Bible story, his brothers sell him to slave traders, which, eh, a bit much, but I feel ya. But in the VeggieTales version, he like, gets sold to a restaurant? Like they mention him getting sold specifically? I wasn't sure if you'd work out when I bought you from those desperados. The fast food industry, am I right, y'all? And like, so much of this story relies on Joe's ability to interpret dreams, a practice that's largely fallen out of favor with the church. I mean, I'm sure some Christians do it, but by and large, it seems like they frown upon it. My point is, it feels out of place, especially in a Western. If they'd at least left it in Bible times, you could kind of chalk it up to old school biblical powers. But by moving so much closer to the modern day, this feels like it's saying God can help you interpret dreams. But hey, I dig that mystic Christian shit. I guess the message is something about using the gifts God gives you, but maybe stick with more relatable gifts like being a good singer. Or don't. Like I said, I kinda dug it. And this one also runs into a problem the series has always struggled with. People die a lot in the Bible, and this one does one of the least effective jobs covering for it. And then little Joe builds a communist utopia. I, I, I'm not even exaggerating, he conscripts everyone to work to save up during the plentiful years and then redistributes it during the years of famine, including, apparently, to foreigners in need. I take it back, this is a good Bible story. I enjoy the presentation, it's a funny episode with good music. I'll say the boy band parody silly song is something that could seem dated, but they do enough genres that this kinda checks out. Although maybe I'm just giving it a pass because it's a good song. This is also the first time we get to see Khalil in an episode. Little Joe's a good one. Not a highlight of the series, but still worth watching. Number 19. These silly song tapes I think are hard to rate against the rest of the series. How do you rate a well-balanced meal against a plate full of candy? This is cutting right to the good stuff. The music. But it is kind of a glorified clip show. This one I'm putting below the other two even though it does have more original stuff than the first one. We did something yesterday. Huh? All you did was order Chinese! Hey, it's hard to say, Mugu Gai Pan. Whoop, I did it again. I'm beat. But it focuses on the pirates who don't do anything, which makes it feel a bit like an extended advertisement for Jonah, a VeggieTales movie. Granted, I'd rather they did that for something like a Silly Song countdown than a normal episode. Looking at you, Gideon. It's also not quite as good as the wraparounds in the first sing-along. And while Do The Mushu is a killer track, I think it's weaker than the other two bonus Silly Songs. Granted, I think Pirates Who Don't Do Anything and Yodeling Veterinary of the Alps are two of the very best silly songs. Really, only sixth place for Yodeling Veterinarian? And Hairbrush Song is number one? I do remember them letting you write in to vote for your favorites, so these are the silly songs picked by fans. But I really gotta disagree. Where is my hairbrush is good, but it did not deserve the top spot. Which I guess is another knock against this one, the others just presented the songs and let you sing along with them. This one's here to tell you which ones are the best. Can't stand it when people rank things, like you're the ultimate authority on what is and isn't the best. This of course does not apply to me, I'm objectively correct about everything. Also, Pog Rape disputes the election results because his song didn't win. Make of that what you will. I also love the reference to the Forgive-O-Matic. 
Yeah, there's stuff I could criticize, but the episode is just sitting through my favorite part of the show, so... Yeah, that makes it an above average one. Do what you want, cause a pirate is free! You are a pirate! Yeah, this one's higher than the countdown, but only by one. I consider them pretty equal. I have ranked it below Silly Song 2 for not having any story. Not that I think you need a story for a sing-along episode. In fact, I could see that becoming annoying if you did it too much. But 2's was good enough to put it up a few slots. This one does at least have funny wraparounds with Larry, but it amounts to little more than a running gag. I could also criticize these for leaving so many songs out. Where's Busy? Or at least the God Made Him Special reprise. It's also bizarre that the entire plot of Rack, Shack, and Benny is that you're not supposed to sing the bunny song. And here they made it the cover of the VHS. Bob tells us that this is the bunny song you're supposed to sing. But that's what Mr. Nezer said, hypocrite, traitor, heretic. Yeah, this sing-along introduces the new, improved bunny song, which is the only version you'll find anywhere outside the original video. You wanna hear the original, you gotta watch the episode. Or look it up on YouTube. Also, the DVDs I've been watching use a slightly updated theme song, so it's nice to finally see the old, old clips again. And I can't deny, it was really cool to just jam out to this music. Strange that, for as big as they became, the pirates who don't do anything started as basically a bonus track to this video. This is their debut episode. So, yeah, this feels like an easy one to recommend if you're looking to revisit the series, but I can't act like it's anything more than it is. A sing-along tape. I'm blue, I'm indeed, I'm Madame Blueberry is an episode I always had mixed feelings about. I think what works about it really works, but man, I always thought Madame Blueberry was kind of an annoying character. In this episode, at least, she's better when she's not crying over everything. And okay, I get, Madame Blueberry gets better, she learns her lesson, but they could have dialed it back a little. Yes, Madame Blueberry is sad because she doesn't have nice things like her neighbors. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! and is persuaded by rapping salesmen to buy a bunch of stuff at the newly opened Stuff Mart. Of course, along the way, she sees people far less fortunate than her, yet are happy despite their poverty. And I've been letting some of the clipping slide. This was amateur CG after all, but this episode feels like it has more clipping than usual. True, they are getting more ambitious with the animation, but they still needed some work. Feels like there's maybe some overlap here with Toy That Saved Christmas. I mean, Buzzsaw Louie even shows up on a banner at Stuff Mart. But where that was ultimately about Christmas, this one's more directly about how material possessions won't make you happy. And it has some of the best music of the show. I'm So Blue and the Stuff Mart rap are killer. That We Thank God for This Day song is so iconic, they used it at the start of every episode for a while. And of course we get the absolute banger, His Cheeseburger. Mr. Lunt got one chance to do his own silly song and he crushed it. And I really want to see this Goliath vs. the Fib movie they're advertising. It's not a perfect episode, but so much about it is perfect, I have to give it some respect. Room for improvement, but overall, a really good one. The real Santa Claus was a real bad, bad dude. Okay, so I watched this episode on the 4th of July. And I included a joke in my script about not getting the video out until Christmas. But joke's on you, old me. I deliberately decided to put this one out at Christmas. 16 years into VeggieTales' run, and they were 3 for 3 on Christmas specials. This one I think is a bit weaker than the two that come before it, but I'm still impressed by how good this episode is. It's hilarious to watch them tiptoe around the fact that Santa doesn't exist. Or, well, no, I guess he does. This is the real-life story of the real Saint Nicholas. I suppose the ending is vague enough to still suggest Santa is real, but I still feel like this kinda lets kids down easy on Santa's non-existence. 
They also stop and warn kids that something sad is coming right before the death of Nicholas's parents. This show was way more prepared to confront death than any other kids show. But then they do this whole long bit with him delivering three gold coins to save these women. Boy, those gold coins sure look like bags of coins. But what was wrong with the coin models you already had? The ending is fun though, even if they go way out of their way to make Nick look like Santa. Although Junior already learned the true meaning of Christmas, and you know what? I don't care. I basically see the veggies as an acting troupe, and these stories they do are equivalent to church Christmas pageants. Which is the canon way he learned the true meaning of Christmas. Neither. They're just stories, man. I'm also kinda okay with Saint Nicholas being a completely new Pepper character. The other times they've done stories about real-life non-Bible characters, one was stylized, which I think worked best, and one was with established veggie actors, which I think works the least. This is a compromise I think works well. Also, Mr. Lunt gets the silly song, and while it's no his cheeseburger, it's still a fun one. Although I wonder how many kids gave donuts to dogs after this song, despite Lunt's warning. Hello, my baby! Hello, my honey! Hello, my raccoon gal! Fun Christmas episode. Not as good as the two that came before it, but far better than the two that came after it. Pizza time. I know I say this about every episode, but Lyle is an odd episode. In this case, I mean, apart from some jokes that don't land, the only thing that doesn't work about the episode is... the message? Archibald takes over to tell us Omelette, a play based on Shakespeare's Hamlet, though deviating a lot from the play. In Shakespeare's day, all the women's roles were played by men! <laughs> I think we're gonna get letters about this. And then he reads the lost Gilbert and Sullivan play Lyle the Kindly Viking about a Viking who returns pillaged loot to Christians. But he better not let the other Vikings find out. And at the end, the Vikings all become Christians, which is actually kind of historically accurate. I didn't know who Gilbert and Sullivan were as a kid, but I've grown to love their work. And yes, the punchline is that it's not by that Gilbert and Sullivan, but there's nothing very Gilbert and Sullivan-y about this play except for like two songs. Not that the songs are bad, the songs are great. Everything is great. Except this episode is supposed to be about sharing and they don't really stick the landing on that one. Omelette is a little too tongue-in-cheek to work. It feels like a joke, not a genuine message. Something on par with the Englishman who went up the hill and came down with all the bananas. And Lyle is less about sharing and more about not stealing? So if they were trying to teach kids to share, I think they failed to tell that story. But if they wanted to make a really good episode, they did that perfectly. I don't even think Lyle has a terrible message, it's just blatantly not about what they're insisting it's about. Plus, like, every kid's show teaches sharing, I don't think they really needed to tell kids that again. But otherwise, this episode's hilarious and fun and the music's great and freaking pizza time who? When I hear Funachili Funachella, I think of the High Silk Hat song every time. Y yes, I had to look up the actual title of that song. This one feels more self-referential than usual, directly calling back to a number of episodes. Art Bugatti shows up, they mention how the Scallion Brothers don't have names. Even Archibald hosting hinges on Jimmy and Jerry hosting King George and the Rubber Ducky. It almost reminds me of how a YouTuber frames their reviews. You did this in this episode, so you have to let me do this now. I liked it. So, uh, yeah, failed your main objective, but otherwise, excellent episode. Just stop being so silly! Another silly song video, but this one gets into silly song lore. In the two previous episodes, Larry's Cebu song ended horribly, and as a result was replaced with Love Songs with Mr. Lunt. The end of silliness sees Larry in his attempt to cope with the cancellation of his silly songs, while Jerry attempts to cheer him up with some music. Finally, Archibald arrives to unveil a petition to reinstate Silly Songs with Larry, which I think might have been real, but don't hold me to that. Like previous Silly Song tapes, I love just getting to chill out and listen to the music, but the story, which is just sort of a fun thing for the people who've been paying attention, adds to the experience while not overstaying its welcome. It feels like a natural way to tell this story. The only weird thing is Jerry saying how funny little guys can do big things too is, 
is not really a humorous song there. I also once again have to comment on the selection, noticeable lack of Larry Boy music despite it getting its own CD release. It's also weird that they did one sing-along five episodes in, another 11 in, and then just none ever again? I wonder why there aren't any more. Like the pirates who don't do anything, this includes the bonus silly song Yodeling Veterinarian of the Alps, which has to be one of my favorites, top three for sure. Overall, it's just a really good experience. It probably shouldn't be this high, but I can't deny my love for it. You better not be a bully because I don't like bullies. Bob and Larry teach us about bullying, first with Junior Asparagus and his friends getting bullied at the playground, and then in an Indiana Jones parody, where Minnesota Cukes searches for Samson's hairbrush while his lifelong bully, Dr. Rattan, foils him at every turn. Heh, <laughs> he's searching for a hairbrush. It's like that one song. I love Junior's segment, real Calvin and Hobbes vibes. I wish we got more real-life stories like this. Although the message is kinda just take your beatings if you have to. I guess there's something in there about not being scared too. I also like the Indiana Jones segment. I think they went in an interesting enough direction with it. Despite this being well-trodden territory, they find some unique ways to go with it. The boulder scene being replaced by a giant snowball? Brilliant. Larry the Cucumber shouldn't work as Indiana Jones, but he totally does. Petunia kinda doesn't work as Marion, but then again, Marion would never work as a VeggieTales character. Also, Lunt is absolutely perfect for the role of Indiana Jones bad guy. So much so, they didn't even replace him in the sequel episode. God used him to fight against the Philistines who were bullying the Israelites. A strong man that fought bullies, huh? Is Bob implying that countries opposing each other other is nothing more than bullying? Cause that's kinda based. This one I think gets the message a little better. Be kind to your enemies. Checks out. Overall, solid episode, even from the era where I didn't watch that often. I've probably seen this one a few times, but chronologically we are rapidly approaching the last episode I've seen. They finally address Bob's hatred of the What Have We Learned song. I do like it! It's just that- Not now, Bob. It's time to talk about the lesson. And in the silly song, Larry orders an anchovy pizza for delivery, which unfortunately means he's going to hell before he dies. Overall, a really good episode. Much better than some of the episodes that came before it. Hi, Huckleberry Finn. Hi, Tom Sawyer. You're Tom, I'm Huck. Tomato Sawyer and Huckleberry Larry's Big River Rescue is not an accurate adaptation of Huckleberry Finn, but it is kind of weird the things they get right. Why is this VeggieTales episode the most accurate depiction of slavery in post-Civil War America I've seen in television? Big Jim, which is probably what I'm going to start calling the actual character from Huck Finn, is forced into unpaid labor on account of being framed for a crime. So when he escapes in an attempt to reunite with his mother, it's up to Tomato Sawyer and Huckleberry Larry to help out. I like this one pretty well, they got some weird jokes. Was that your dog barking? Uh, no, that was Steve. He likes to bark when we chase things. And it's a pretty good message. Huck Finn being your go-to example of someone helping a stranger in need is quite endearing, I think. It adds a subtext to the episode only those familiar with the book will understand. And aw oh, yeah, they brought George back! I don't think we've seen him since, like, episode 6. It's weird, every time I think the show has finally fallen off, they pop out with something like this and I'm just like, how? How are you still good, but only on rare occasions? I'll say it's a weaker silly song, but not even a bad one. And that's the only part of this episode I don't like as much. Although I do think it's pretty reasonable for Tom to go home and wait for the government man while Larry reunites Big Jim with his mother. There's really no reason they both need to go, at least that they know of. It honestly kinda helps them in the climax that he left and came back. But other than that, 
that really good episode, which is astounding. We are past the halfway mark. This is an episode I have no nostalgia or even recollection of. And while the half dozen or so episodes that came before this are cluttering up the lower middle of the list, here's one that legitimately deserves to stand among the golden era of the series. Who would have guessed? When you're a duck, you're a duck all the way from the first time you quack to the last egg you lay. I was excited to watch King George and the Rubber Ducky because I remember really liking this one as a kid. And to my shock, upon watching it, I suddenly recalled, oh yeah, the good stuff in this is good, but it drags here and there. And that's to my memory, how it was as a kid, too. The good parts always stuck with me so much, I was always excited to watch it again, and was always unfortunately reminded of the really unmemorable moments. Worst of all, I think, is this really forgettable song at the end. VeggieTales songs are nothing if not extremely memorable. But yeah, the good stuff is really good. It has some of the highest highs of the series. Today we learn about selfishness through an absolute wild adaptation of David and Bathsheba that keeps just enough of the story for you to know it's David and Bathsheba, a story about David sending a dude to die in a war because he saw the dude's wife naked. VeggieTales replaces the woman with a rubber ducky and of course Uriah doesn't die. Also he's played by Junior which adds a weird extra layer to this too. Larry's spying on a child bathing then sends him to die die in a war, which he comes back from legitimately shell-shocked. It's pretty funny, and aside from the song I dissed a second ago, the music's really good. Endangered Love is a fun, silly song, even if I don't think it's the best. Also, this bit with Jimmy and Jerry doing a bad job hosting is pretty funny. The Englishman who went up the hill and came down with all the bananas is absolutely brilliant. Yes, sir! Stop it! I know, but I've got all the bananas! It maybe hurts the overall pacing, but I don't know, I think it's worth it. I mean, I've declared this the 11th best episode of the series. It's not like the pacing is that bad, it's just a little off in places. Still an excellent episode, still one I look forward to seeing again, even if there's a few dead limbs in there I might have trimmed. Snotty beamed me twice last night. It was wonderful. You can definitely still tell this is the third episode, but I still say this is the first great episode of the show. It opens on a very Dr. Seuss-inspired version of The Good Samaritan, which kinda does have the plot of a Dr. Seuss story. They nail his style perfectly. And hey, it's that potato again. Say goodbye, it's his last appearance. I love the absolute gall of these... Uh, hold on. harlots for singing about how busy they are instead of helping. Where Is My Hairbrush was never my favorite silly song. I probably actually preferred forgive a matic but it's a start. We've still got Bob and Larry randomly entering Junior's room, although in a spaceship this time. This is honestly one framing device too many, but they quickly whisk him away to a Star Trek parody, which is better than them just sitting around in his room and singing. Although it's probably for the best they just start at the parody from here on out. This segment is openly about Junior learning to not be racist. And besides, he talks kind of funny. Now, Junior, he doesn't talk funny. He just talks different. His family is from another country. Yeah, I know. It still sounds funny. Hilarious introduction to Jimmy and Jerry Gord, plus I always liked Scooter the Scottish Carrot. Pretty good segment paired with the fantastic opening makes this one the first episode I'd call essential. Unless you really want the full experience, I might start with episode 3. Not that 1 and 2 are bad, just this is more like the Veggie Tales you remember. Hmm, I forgot you could tempt me with things I want. Even as the general quality of the show goes downhill, Larry Boy still manages to hold to a certain standard. It's not quite as good as the first two, but it's still a really good episode. Bumblyberg is visited by a seductive apple looking to tempt them into indulgence. So it's up to the town's mayor, Madame Blueberry, local news anchor Petunia Rhubarb, and of course their hero, Larry Boy, to stop her. Honestly, 
This is my favorite Petunia episode. She's given not one, but two things to do. She's a reporter and a gamer. And despite recreating the iconic kiss shot from Spider-Man, she doesn't really serve as a romantic interest this time. Making a more Spider-Man inspired episode does pull it from its Batman inspired roots, but I still think it works in part because I think Raimi's Spider-Man is as iconic as Burton's Batman. Plus, Larry Boy swinging from his super suction ears like Spider-Man isn't really that much of a stretch. And the villain is actually the one spinning spider webs? Haha, <laughs> because you're trapped in a web of temptation. Also, I don't know how many people are into anthro food characters, but at least half of them were awakened by this sexy apple lady literally singing about being temptation, and the other half by the green M&M. Alright everyone! She's no rumor weed, but her villain song is pretty good. I also love how people look at her weird when she just strolls up singing it. They got kind of lucky with this villain. There's a common phrase about bad apples, plus she represents temptation, and the apple is often used as the forbidden fruit in the story of Adam and Eve, even though technically the Bible doesn't say what fruit it was. And while they still admit Larry Boy can't defeat temptation alone, he is at least involved in defeating the bad guy this time. The new Rock On Larry Boy song isn't quite as good as the classic theme, but it's at least good enough that I didn't miss the old one. Honestly, it's quite the feat that this has made it into my top 10. This is one I only watched once when I was young. From here, it's all episodes I grew up on. So that tells you how good this one really is. Obviously not my favorite Larry Boy episode, but a great one nonetheless. I'm a Swedish plumber, I'm here to fix your pipes. While I wish Toy Who Saved Christmas was one that got brought out more than once a year, this was one I was more okay with being just a Christmas thing as a kid. It was a little too dry for my taste, but somehow I like it more now than I did then. I kind of enjoyed the grander story, it does write what I think Esther didn't quite do. Sure, it's a grander, more serious story, but it's a Christmas episode. It makes sense to go a little grander with that. Plus, it focuses on Bob and Larry, who in this story are a pair of Gilbert and Sullivan-esque playwrights, trying to put on a grand Christmas pageant to teach London to love again. Unfortunately, a church Christmas play is displaying the Star of Christmas, a Christmas decoration embedded with royal gems, for the first time in 80 years. The star hasn't been publicly displayed since February 12, 1803, due to the perceived security risks from the reigns of King Charles the Greedy and Cedric the I'll Eat Anything Star-Shaped. So they have to attempt to steal the star to ensure their message on the true meaning of Christmas is heard by everyone, whether it's correct or not. I think my newfound enjoyment is mostly from not having seen it in a while, but there is something I see on a deeper level knowing the story behind VeggieTales. The creators of the show playing writers trying to put on a grand musical spectacle to teach everyone something important, and the fear that not only are you distracting from the real message, but that you're going to destroy everything in the process. There's maybe some of Phil Vischer and Mike Naraki's real life under the the surface of this story. Another thing I like is that Bob gets to take the lead. It's weird, he's kind of the face of the show, but he rarely gets to be the lead character. There are a few episodes where he gets to share the spotlight, but even those are rare. He's usually a secondary, if not tertiary, if not a glorified cameo character. Apart from this episode, I think his only other leading role is in Little House That Stood. So yeah, give me a Bob-focused episode. Unfortunately, I'm legally required to point out that the plot of their Christmas play is literally the go-to cliché plot for a porno. The tale of a woman falling for her plumber? Come on. A really good episode, though it's not even my favorite Christmas episode. Fun, deep, and something to chew on beneath the surface. And now, our feature presentation. 
Listen, I don't think Jonah of VeggieTales movie is a perfect movie, but I do think it's a perfect VeggieTales movie. I can't imagine a better feature-length outing from this series. It is exactly what it needs to be. The animation is ambitious, the story is grand, the jokes hit, and all without losing the sense that this is VeggieTales. Oh, and the music! I know, I'm complimenting VeggieTales music, which is consistently great. But you know what? If ever there was a time to bring your A-game, it was in the movie, and oh boy, they brought it. Every single song is a hit, including and especially... Drive into the river, Bob! Oh, drive into the river, Bob! I am holding this music to a higher standard than usual, and it's still hitting. On the way to see a musician, Laura taunts Junior with the backstage pass she won, despite being told not to brag. However, she loses it in a number of increasingly severe issues plaguing the van they're in, ending with it smashed into a tree stump and Bob very angry at his co-pilot, Daddy Asparagus. Junior takes the opportunity to lord it over Laura for her behavior and insisting she got what she deserved, but after laying into it a little too hard, Laura storms off, prompting the pirates who don't do anything to tell him, and eventually the whole group, the story of Jonah from the Bible. A character who's actually unredeemed by the end of his story? A tragic hero in the VeggieTales movie. And I mean, he legitimately wants these people to die. I know I've already said it, but VeggieTales is way edgier than it gets credit for. And I love that Khalil, here making his debut, just lays into him with words I think a lot of Christians need to to hear. Has it ever occurred to you that maybe God loves everybody, not just you? That maybe he wants to give everyone a second chance? Honestly, I like Khalil. He's a solid voice of reason with enough comedy to be worth a laugh here and there. And I guess Archibald appearing as the rock star they were going to see at the end adds some closure to his character while still leaving it truthful to the Bible story. For real, this is one of those movies I've seen enough times that I practically haven't memorized, even though I don't really think about it. Like, I couldn't just start reciting the movie to you you without help, but I felt like I could easily mouth along with it when it was on. I always knew what the characters were about to say. I do think there's a bit of padding in there, but not too much. It absolutely justifies its runtime. Laura and Junior's arc is not exactly subtle, but it's a dynamic I always enjoy seeing. Yeah, solid movie. Exactly what it should have been, and an accessible entry point for people who've never seen the series. But there are some episodes I have to rank over. Over it. I didn't want to tell you this, but if you don't buy me, you'll die. VeggieTales first Christmas special and oh man, I want a toy with a buzzsaw for a hand. Weird that the vegetables have a human toy. I bet you could convince someone this was test footage for the tin toy Christmas special that became Toy Story. Yeah, the toy that saved Christmas feels like an obvious enough concept, but coming out a year after Toy Story feels a bit suspicious. Still, I really like this one. Mr. Nezzer builds a toy that tells kids the true meaning of Christmas is getting more toys. But one toy decides he doesn't like that and with the help of Bob Larian Jr. finds the truth and begins spreading it. Something that doesn't go over well with Nezzer. Oddly, he goes by Wally B. Nezzer, the brother of Nebby K. Nezzer from Rack Shack and Benny. And yeah, it does feel a bit like that one in ways, but I think it stands out in Enough. I love how on the nose a toy that tells you the true meaning of Christmas's toys is. Literally, you press his nose and he says it. George makes a really good narrator. Shame he stopped showing up at a point. The music's a lot of fun, especially the special Christmas silly song, Oh Santa. I think it didn't get enough love because it was a Christmas song. This totally belonged in that top 10 silly song countdown. And honestly, I feel like this episode didn't get enough love because it was a Christmas episode. I watched the other videos on repeat, but this one really only came out around Christmas and I kind of wish I'd seen more of it. It's really funny. I recall the you roll your dice, you move your mice, nobody gets it's hurt line, getting quoted incessantly at my house growing up. Overall, a really memorable Christmas episode, one I wish I'd gotten to see more of as a kid, but hey, that kind of makes it more special. And hey, if ever there was a time for VeggieTales to do something great, 
it'd be Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Future events such as these will affect you in the future. I am kind of surprised Larry's Wonderful World of Autotainment is this high on the list, but then again, no I'm not. For one thing, it's one of the funniest episodes that has only grown more prophetic with each passing year. No wonder this episode has spawned so many memes. Oh, oh, like how to tell nonsense jokes and be emotionally unstable? Yeah, that's our generation in a nutshell. But it's really focused on the music, and while the songs aren't original, they're at least original to the show. And they even work in a message, so that really gives it the edge over the sing-alongs. Even if, in the end, it's primarily focused on the music and the message seems like a bit of an afterthought, you couldn't have done every episode like this or it wouldn't have felt special. But that's kinda what works about it. It's a special episode of the show and it nails what a special episode could be. I don't think I can say it's the best episode. Like if someone asked what I loved about VeggieTales, this episode wouldn't really explain a lot. But in context, it's great. An easy top five pick. Now you wanna get nuts? Come on, let's get nuts. Much like Jimmy Neutron, an episode of VeggieTales ended up in my childhood trauma video. Unlike Jimmy Neutron, however, I think this is a really good episode. I told you I wasn't being biased saying Flippy was a bad episode. This one is fun and creative and they put a lot of effort into this. It's so cool, man. Yeah, the fib creeped me out as a kid, but in a cool, interesting way this time. Jimmy Neutron just tapped into my natural fear of ventriloquist dummies. A fib drops in on Junior and convinces him to lie, but each lie causes the fib to get bigger. You've got legs. Yes, I do. Larry Boy, despite his best efforts, can't find the fib nor defeat him, and in the end it's up to Junior to admit his wrongdoing. I love this episode, and while I wish I'd been able to appreciate it more as a kid, I think that makes it more special to me now, because it's an episode from my favorite era that I didn't watch that much. I can criticize it for barely featuring Larry Boy, who hardly helps anything, but I don't care. I love Junior and the fib story. More more Larry Boy would be nice, but this episode works fine without it. They do a really fun take on Burton's Batman, to the point when I finally saw Batman I was like, oh, it's like Larry Boy. The Larry Boy theme song is a more than acceptable replacement for a silly song. It is seriously so good, certified banger, and there's a remix on the CD where Larry Boy raps. Hey! I got something to say, ad lip, fib in the crib, oh great, Junior broke a plate, daddy walking in the door, our bigotti on the floor. I mean, it's not the episode that originated Larry Boy, but I think they knew they could make him work as a long-term fixture of the series, and this episode is the proof. Not quite my favorite he's in, but one that deserves credit for delivering a very good episode of the show and of Larry Boy. You might think ranking this directly above the other Larry Boy episode means it was a hard-fought battle, that I really had to consider which one of these would get the higher spot. No, not really. Rumor Weed is clearly the better episode, to me at least. I'll grant you, it does kinda just repeat what the Fib did, but I think it's the improved version. It takes everything that works about the Fib and expands upon it. But you know, the Fib was already such a good episode, there really wasn't that much room to rank this higher. I don't think the Fib needed a villain song, but the Rumor Weed song is clearly one of the things elevating it. Plus, they put a lot more into the animation. This might be the best looking episode. They've got such a fully realized city, with a bunch of incidentals we never get to see again. In the episode after this, the graphics get an upgrade, so this onion, these mushrooms, this pumpkin, those peppers, all just disappear. Larry Boy feels a lot more involved in this one, despite the fact that it's still up to Junior to defeat the rumor weed. He at least gets this running gag of trying to defeat it to no avail. It's got him by the ear good one. And there's something I kinda like about how quickly this town turns a tiny little thing about Alfred, the most overtly queer-coded character on the show near to the point of stereotype, into him being evil and dangerous. I'm not a robot! 
The rumor weed is also kind of freaky, but not give me nightmares scary like the fib. Although the real nightmare fuel is this human woman from the beginning? Why is it a human? Why is there a human woman here? Also, <laughs> weed. Larry Boy episodes are pretty consistently good ones, but this has to be my favorite. I think as a kid, this episode was my favorite of the whole series. Larry Boy is a character that's just really fun to see, and to me, this is his definitive outing. Now go away or I shall taunt you a second time! Josh and the Big Wall is a great episode, top five for sure. But what makes it specifically second place? Honestly, I want to say nostalgia. Not that that's the only thing pushing it way up on the list. I look at my top five and I go, oh yeah, that's peak Veggie Tales right there. But putting them in order is a little more difficult. Why is this one second place? I mean, something had to be. And this one just pulled at my nostalgia a little harder than the others. I am nostalgic for a lot of them. This one just hits the hardest. And that's still not even enough to make it number one. Anyways, I don't have to justify my ranking to you. Let's just talk about the episode. This episode presents a strong question, one I think is kinda central to Veggie Tales as a piece of religious media. Why should we listen to God? What if God tells you to do something ridiculous, like walk around a wall and blow horns and you'll defeat the people who stand in your way? Well, because he keeps his promises good things will happen to you. That kind of cuts to the heart of the show, doesn't it? This is conveyed to us through the story of Joshua and the city of Jericho. Perfectly delivered, by the way. Some of the most memorable music and some of the funniest jokes of the series. Three square meals a day, plenty of exercise. Oh, it was paradise. We were in slavery! It takes the idea of vegetables telling Bible stories and makes it feel not ridiculous. It does have one of their lame little God Loves Us So Much songs. You know the kind. Yes, there are songs about God's love that are great in this series, but sometimes it just feels half-hearted, like they were mandated to have at least one God Loves You song in there, but this one's never seeing a sing-along because it is just nothing. And this one in particular has an unfortunate colonialist slant to it. The Lord have given the plan to us. Yeesh. But that's the only problem I have with this episode. And yeah, no one's jamming to that one on their own time, but the promised land is where it's at. The Song of the Cebu is a top five silly song. And how come we're not allowed to sing the bunny song, but keep walking is fine? I guess it's less worshipful and more arrogant. Not quite the best episode, but a more than worthy second place. I love it. <laughs> Rack, Shack, and Benny retells the story of Radshack, Meshach, and Abednego from the Book of Daniel. In the story, the Israelites are slaves of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. However, this adaptation sets the story at a factory in modern America. And while the characters are explicitly paid in this version, the implication is clear. They're comparing the plight of the modern worker to that of the slavery of old. This adaptation also sees Nebuchadnezzar's statue of himself replaced with that of a chocolate bunny which in many ways changes the symbolism. He is not forcing allegiance to himself, a king, but to a product, and by extension, the company that makes it. In this, VeggieTales modernizes the message to one of anti-capitalism and anti-consumerism. The chocolate bunny is a particularly potent symbol as well. The bunny, of course, is known as a symbol of sexual virality, thus lending perhaps a bit of an anti-lust message, but I think more pertinently is that the bunny is made of chocolate. The episode makes a pretty clear clear indictment of chocolate, which I suppose is to be expected from vegetables, but more broadly they criticize overindulgence of sweets. That's not to mention the chocolate bunny's association with Easter. It's a symbol often pointed to as distracting from the religious meaning of the holiday. In this, Veggie Tales criticizes capitalism of being lustful, gluttonous, and above all, idolatrous. For as the Book of Mark says, Money degrades the gods of men until they are nothing more than commodities to be bought and sold. 
And just to prove they mean it, this episode features one of the most direct acts of divine intervention of any episode. The villain tries to actually kill them for not submitting to our corporate overlords, and only fails because God himself saves them, which granted is lifted directly from the Bible story. Overall, it's a grand adaptation with a lot to chew on. Also, the jokes are really funny, and the music is killer, they wrote a villain song so good they had to make a more appropriate version of it, so no one sings the sinful version. In the silly song, Larry badmouths Bob to his face and Bob tries to beat him up. But Bob, if you respond to a musical insult with real-world violence, you've already lost the battle. Yeah, not only is this the episode they really found their footing, I think they found it so well they never quite topped themselves. I think the tomato is sitting. I'm standing. Sitting. Look, this is sitting, and this is standing. I'm standing. There's not an episode I can put above this one. This, to me, is the purest essence of VeggieTales. You want to know why I love VeggieTales? This episode right here. No doubt in my mind, Rack Shack and Benny is the number one episode of VeggieTales. And that's the series. Although, unlike Jimmy Neutron, where I was pretty exhaustive, I actually left a lot to be talked about. Not in terms of the episodes, just extra things, you know? But honestly, I am totally down to keep looking back at this series forever. That Jimmy Neutron video was the first time I'd revisited the series since childhood, but VeggieTales I revisited before I started high school. Granted, that's still over a decade ago now, but it's a show I come back to often. And while this will definitely be the only time I watch every single episode, I have no doubts I will come back to some of my favorites again and again and again. I mean, between high school and now, I listen to the music of this show constantly. Yeah, I love VeggieTales. I always have and I always will. I guess to compare it to the one other show I've reviewed, the best episodes are better than Jimmy Neutron's best, and its worst is better than Jimmy Neutron's worst. But I still think Jimmy is a more consistently good show. Aside from a handful of misses, I think most of Jimmy Neutron is still pretty good. Meanwhile, probably more than a third of this series is mired in mediocrity. It helps that Jimmy Neutron's 49 episodes were made over the course of 4 years, while VeggieTales' 50 episodes were made over the course of 22. Less time for the show to get watered down in. But Jimmy Neutron and VeggieTales are different shows I like for different reasons. At a point, VeggieTales just became fine, generally. And not only does that make the episodes less interesting, but it means a misstep is gonna misstep much further than it used to. Early VeggieTales had a dud or two, but that failure is only amplified when the show is already so average. I almost worry this ranking doesn't accurately reflect how good some of these episodes are. Like, more than once I was like, why is that ranked so low? I gotta move that up. Only to look at the list and go, oh no, it's exactly where it belongs. I honestly think something like Duke and the Great Pie War is closer in quality to, say, Wizard of Haas, an episode it's ranked 12 spots below, than it is to Little House That Stood, which it's only 6 slots above. And I can confidently say I've enjoyed my time revisiting the series. I look forward to doing more TV show reviews. Especially since I have a promise to fulfill. Before we go, just a little story I wanted to tell. The only video of mine my mother has watched is my old childhood trauma video, and even that one she stopped watching pretty quick because she was upset that I was swearing about Veggie Tales, and she is now convinced that my entire YouTube channel is just me swearing about Veggie Tales. Well, guess what? I just made it through every single episode of the original VeggieTales series without swearing once. Fuck you, Mom! Yeah!